All right. I'm going to call the March 21st, 2023 Committee of the Whole to order. Um, first on our agenda is roll call. Clerk, please. Commissioner DeLue. Here. Commissioner Gissler. Here. Vice Chair Heffler. Here. Commissioner Mazur. Here. Commissioner Morales. Present. Vice Chair Ray. Commissioner Strebs. Here. Chair Taylor. Here. Commissioner Wheeler. Here. Nine present. Thank you very much. Uh, next up on our agenda is roll as public comment. This is an opportunity for citizens to address the Board of Commissioners. Give us your name and address, and please keep in mind you have three minutes. Thank you. I got it now, red. All right. Um, good day, afternoon, commissioners, chair, vice chair. My name is Jeff Ketting. I'm the Kalamazoo County Prosecuting Attorney. I know that this is an issue that you're aware of. As a couple of weeks ago, you received an email from my office, the clerk, the treasurer, um, the sheriff's office as well. You've also heard employees from the courts talk about this issue in previous meetings. And in reviewing your agenda today, as you list by a business priorities budget, business priorities employees. I felt like this was a good opportunity to have a public comment on this issue. It's one that you've inherited, not one that came about because of actions of this board. And it was one that is, I think, totally unintentional. After the Siegel compensation classification study was completed, employees got moved into some employees into different bands entirely, some employees into what are really equivalent bands, and then they got slotted into steps within those bands. And that's where the problem happened. We had newer employees who benefited from this greatly. We have senior employees who were otherwise topped out who have benefited from this by the ability to have additional steps to move forward in terms of compensation. But there were a small number of employees in the middle who got sort of whipsawed. They got their 2% cost of living increase, but that was it. And that's less than that they would have gotten under the legacy schedule, the one that we moved from, the old K-band schedule, because they would have also gotten a step increase, which to date, the determination has been, isn't going to happen. So there was a small group of employees in different departments, including my own, who were stuck in the middle, who got a 2% increase, where everyone else got more. And it actually, it means that they're making less this year than they would have under the K-band schedule with a step increase, which again, isn't fair. At your last meeting, I watched as you addressed the salary issue for part-time seasonal employees, people who aren't even working here now, got a 15% salary increase as you raised the compensation from $13 to $15 on your own, not at the request of a department head or administration or anyone else, you did something for people who don't even work here. And to date, you're not doing something for a small number of people who do. And that is causing a problem within my department, within the courts, within all departments, right? We, we're treating these employees, long-term people, five years, 10 years, 15 years, differently than they should. And it's not a large amount of money. In my department, to make this right costs less than $7,000 a year. That's it. Less than $10,000 a year. And I heard four times that described in one of your meetings as small potatoes. Why are we even talking about it? I hope that as part of your addressing budget priorities, employees, and as you open, reopen the budget to look at additional revenue sources that are coming into the county, that you look first to those employees who have been here 
five years, 10 years, 15 years, and who did not benefit in the same way as their coworkers as we transition from the previous K band schedule to our new compensation classification schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any other citizens wishing? Clerk, place. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Vice Chair Pro Tem, Commissioners. Um, I'm here today uh, to say thank you. Oh, it, and I breathe a sigh of relief. So uh, last time I was here, or typically when I'm here, we're oftentimes asking for something. And so I wanted to share with you some really great news, which is we have a huge program and project happening right here at the county in the basement right now. We have US Imaging that's scanning about 1500 land record books. Um, if you get an opportunity between your meetings, they are working a 24 seven shift. Uh, so you will be able to go to the basement and see them in action. Also, our uh, fabulous uh, PIO uh, was able to capture some images of the project happening uh, last week and shared that on social media. But just as a refresher, and for those of you who were not present uh, or on the board last year, this is part of a large ARPA project. I came to the board to request over $600,000 to be able to uh, preserve and protect the county's critical infrastructure, that being our land records. We have land records, uh, which is an original, uh, and even the redundancy as microfilm, which is at risk. Our original records were at risk. And so I came to the board and said, we need additional ARPA dollars to protect and preserve our critical infrastructure. And the board said, yes, it sounds like a great opportunity. And within uh, within hours of me being able to submit uh, a contract, I was able to do so. Uh, I looked to the administrator because we kind of joked because the moment you all said yes, um, I started an RFP process and we uh, are now well into the project. And I'm uh, pleased to share that actually phase one of the project, which includes scanning old microfilm uh, for the years uh, 1985 to 1969 has been complete. Uh, my staff is reviewing those documents right now and hopefully they will go online soon. Uh, the stuff that's happening in the basement, those record books go back to 1836. So they're pretty cool. Um, I think, but nonetheless, I just wanted to take the opportunity today to say thank you and uh, to encourage you between meetings to go take a look and to thank uh, US Imaging, which is a Michigan based company uh, who's doing the work. So thank you very much and have a great meeting. <laughs> Believe me, I wasn't going to gavel. I was going to get in so much trouble for that. <laughs> Are there any other citizens wishing to address the board? All right. Seeing none, we will move on to our up. Oh, oh, commission. We, we do have one uh, recorded uh, comment tonight. Uh, Dina, can you advise us that if that is for the uh, committee of the whole or the regular meeting? Chair, yes, for both means I think we're bringing it up. Bring it up. Thank you. Alpha County Board of Commissioners on March 21. During the public comment section of the 4 p.m. meeting on March 7, Adrian Zaya from the YWCA asked the Board of Commissioners for $90,000 to support the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund. Daniel Hamilton, also from the YWCA, spoke in favor of the request at both the 4 p.m. and the 7 p.m. meetings on March 7. I'm calling today to strongly oppose such funding. The YWCA Reproductive Health Fund 
provides financial support for a variety of reproductive and counter-reproductive services. At the top of their list is increasing access to abortion. In 2021, they received funding from three sources, including $43,900 from Kalamazoo County. That money had originally been earmarked for Southwest Michigan First, but was rescinded from them and given instead to the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund. That measure passed by a single vote. In order to gain the deciding vote, proponents promised to draft a contract stipulating that Kalamazoo County taxpayer money would not be used for abortions. Although well-intentioned, that contract ended up being merely cosmetic. Using the county money to pay for non-abortion expenses freed up money from the other two sources that could then be used for abortions. Now the YWCA is asking the county for more than twice as much money for their reproductive health fund. During 2021, the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund received major funding from the National Institute for Reproductive Health and from the Collaborative for Gender and Reproductive Equity. In 2022, they received money from New York City philanthropist and multimillionaire Agnes Gund. They clearly have funding sources other than Cal. Is that it, Kevin? Yes, that was the only recorded call. Uh, Dean, I'm advised on any hands that are raised. At this time, we do not have any hands raised. Thank you. Okay, that moves us on to interviews for Kalamazoo County Transit uh, Transportation Authority. And we'll start with uh, Diane Anderson. You'd like to. Uh, step up to the podium. This is my first interview as chair, so I'm going to, you have to <laughs> bear with me a little bit. Okay, we all have uh, the uh, application in our uh, civic clerk, but um, Dale, I think I'll, do you have a list of uh, the questions? Let's start on that side. Well, actually, I'll just, um, if you want to give an opportunity to introduce yourself to the board, I think I'd give you everybody that, that chance would probably be, I don't see it in our, our list here, but um, if you want to just share a little bit about yourself. And... Sure. Um, I'm Diane Anderson. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs at Western Michigan University. I came to Western in 94 as the Dean of Students, and then I moved into the Vice President's role in 2002. So I've had the opportunity to live um, in this Kalamazoo community for a long time, and I absolutely love it here. My husband and I built a home in Ashtamo, so we are residents of Ashtamo. And um, again, I've lived here now, I'm in my 30th year, and both of our moms moved here uh, since they figured we were staying put. So uh, this has really become home. So we have, it's been a great place for us to live. Um, Commissioner DeLue, do you have a question or should I, I can skip to Commissioner Gissler. He looks, oh, you got him. Okay. Do you want to start with the first one? Ms. Anderson. Yes. What do you know about the advisory board and why are you interested in serving that? Well, I understand that this board is one of two boards that uh, looks at transportation issues for this entire area, Kalamazoo County and the larger area. And because our students rely so heavily on public transportation, I'm really interested in being a part of the conversation. Um, we have, as you know, many international students that come to Western Michigan University. They do not have vehicles, so they rely heavily on public transportation. But we also have a lot of students that do not have their own cars. And so again, they rely on public transportation and Western now, as you know, has a College of Health and Human Services, a College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and a College of Aviation, which are not on the main campus. So our students have come to depend on um, the transportation. I would also say, which is not related to my job, but my mother-in-law um, was a frequent user of the Kalamazoo um, Metro, the, the small, the connect 
uh, because she needed that uh, transportation to get around town because she does not drive. Um, she no longer is able to use that. She has dementia, so she's not um, taking that transportation, but really relied heavily on it. So I know that there are lots of folks who depend heavily on the service. So I'm very interested in being a part of the conversation and deliberations about how we continue to serve um, the various constituents effectively. Commissioner Gissler, you wanna jump on the next one? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm John Gissler. I used to represent South County and since the uh, reconfiguration following the uh, uh, census, uh, I'm not sure what you can call my current district, but it's five townships sort of east and south. Okay. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we rode up in the elevator together. <laughs> she pointed me, he pointed me in the right direction. So I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> What experience do you have that's related to the work of the advisory board? This could be professional or experience you have from the community. Well, I think I would say largely it's uh, working with our students. So knowing um, how our students are use this service, um, I think that would be one of the things. I've also been involved in other kinds of advisory boards. So I know that advisory boards have a real opportunity to make a difference in a community. Um, the advisory board that I worked most most significantly on was a state level board and it was the Michigan ACE which is the American Council of Education um, Women's Network and we were focused on advancing um, women in leadership roles so I've been on that board for probably about 20 years and I've loved my time on that board because it's, it gives you a larger vantage point of the different issues and needs that people have and that, that one is statewide so I think here, really the most significant work and the most important connection I have is with the work that I do with students. Um, because whether it's undergrad students or graduate students or contemporary students that we call our, our more non-traditional students, um, they rely heavily on the services that are provided by Kalamazoo. And so again, I think my work uh, listening to student voice and being able to present their needs to this body would be really important. Thank you. Commissioner Mazur. Okay, I think you already mentioned this before, but uh, share what you've learned from working with people from different cultures. Mm, I love that question. That makes me, that, that question makes me smile. That's part of the reason I do what I do. I love working with diversity and with people from all different cultures. Western has a great student body and we have significant number of international students. We have a growing BIPOC population, which is um, students of color. And we um, are wanting to grow that even more significantly as the demographics in our country are changing. So we, um, I've had lots of experience. One of the areas that used to report to me was multicultural affairs. I also have worked with LBGTQ students um, and international populations. So all of those students um, have at some point been in my portfolio. Um, and as I've worked with them, I've come to understand and appreciate the needs that, and the richness that they bring to our community. So um, would love the opportunity to continue to connect with them and represent the issues that they have. Um, and I can tell you right now, I already know some that are on the agenda for our students because as we cut back on hours for students and sometimes some of the routes that have happened on campus, um, students are still in class when the last bus comes and that's a problem for students that don't have cars. So, and uh, we, the other thing I would say, and this is a national issue, not just a Western issue, we have more and more students that have um, housing insecurity, food insecurity, transportation insecurity. So we're seeing students who um, come to us for financial assistance for any of those three things. So having a robust transportation system would really be so helpful for them in terms of taking care of their transportation needs. Vice Chair Ray. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tammy Ray. I represent District 1. Um, my question is, what training or education have you received in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? Um, it's actually a two-part. And how will you use what you learn in your work with this advisory board? So my graduate work in student affairs was about understanding students, which included the diversity of students. And over the years, that diversity has changed. 
since I finished my graduate work, I've done a lot of different training, whether it be webinars or attending conferences. Um, I participated in the ERASE um, training here in this Kalamazoo, which was awesome. Um, I've brought a lot of different speakers and training to my staff because it's important to me that my staff are well educated. One of the tools that we have used is the intercultural development inventory, and it really talks about how to communicate effectively across cultures. Um, I love that the, the new thinking about it is not cultural competence, but cultural humility. So we have moved in our thinking that no one's ever really competent in understanding all forms of diversity, but what we need to develop is cultural humility. And I frankly think that's true for people that are white and have had privilege in this country. So understanding cultural humility, I think, is a really important training. Unconscious bias is another piece of training that I've engaged in. And our staff engages in that before we um, have any we're, hire any people. We want to make sure that our our search committees are well trained in terms of unconscious bias so that we make the best decisions and best um, hires. So again, I've had lots of training in that area and um, I would definitely use that and bring that to my experience on the board because one size does not fit all and we need to be conscious of that in our decision making because sometimes we may make a decision that might be good for one demographic but not good for another. So we need to be thoughtful about all of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, my name is John Taylor. I represent District 5. But uh, what do you expect the advisory board authority to give to the community? And how can you help the work of the advisory board authority? Well, I think that this advisory board needs to be good stewards of the money that you've been entrusted with in terms of um, taxes and make sure that we're offering the best possible transportation system we can given the resources that we have. And if they're not enough resources, figure out how to go about um, requesting additional resources so that, the re that so we have adequate um, transportation for our uh, community. So I um, think all of that is important. So I think this, this body needs to really be aware and conscious of what the needs of the community are so that we're responsive and providing the needs that um, they have. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Pro Tem Hepler. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Hepler. I represent District 7, which is the northeast part of Kalamazoo County, uh, Cooper, Richland, Ross, and uh, Charleston. Um, Excellent. And uh, my question for you tonight is uh, what three things uh, that a board member of the advisory board or authority should consider? Well, I think I just kind of named some of them. what are the needs of the customers or the users of the services, um, how best to meet those needs, and how to deploy resources most effectively to do that. So I would be say those would be the three things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. Happy Hello. Women's History Month, and thank you for all of your leadership and your service that you dedicated to Western Michigan Thank University. You. Thank you. Always a great day to be a Bronco. Yay. Yay. Absolutely. All right. So I'm on Tees Morales District 3. Uh, what must this advisory board authority do or practice to be successful? Um, I would say good listening, good listening to the, consti the constituents, finding out what the needs are, and then looking at the resources that you all have been granted and figure out how best to deploy those. I think it's really important to be aware of what the cutting edge thinking is about transportation because that does it's not a static industry, it changes. So whether it's intermodal or looking at how we think about Uber and Lyft and buses and uh, many, you know, all of the different things and trains, how we can deploy the resources that we have at any given time. So again, um, nowadays we need to be thinking about being good environmental stewards too. So how do we think about um, bringing in transportation that will be environmentally friendly? We need to be thinking about that as well. So I think all of those things need to be taken into consideration as, as this body makes decisions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Strebs. Thank you. Welcome to you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Yes. Uh, so I'm Commissioner Jen Strebs. I represent District 2. Uh, that's part of 
Westwood neighborhood, Arcadia, and Western's campus okay. as well. And I also serve as the liaison for the KCTA and okay. CCTA as a board member. So um, my question for you is, what are three things that this advisory board should be aware of before making decisions? That's the wrong one. I, did I think? I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> that's I okay. put my note on the top right. of the wrong question. That's all right. So our question is actually, how do you handle and resolve conflicts? Well, I think it's really important to hear all sides. I tell my staff, there's never two sides to a story. There's usually eight sides to a story. So you need to get all sides of the information uh, before you can make a really good decision. But resolving conflict, first and foremost, uh, requires good listening, because sometimes people listen without hearing. And so I think it's important to listen well and find out really what it is that people are saying. Because sometimes the initial thing that comes out of their mouth isn't really the issue. So getting at what the, the root of the issue is, I think is really important. I think sometimes conflicts get lost in the emotion. And so you gotta find out what the really underlying issue is. So I think that requires good listening skills. It also requires knowing how to ask the right questions because sometimes, um, the questions that you ask will really help you get at the, the, the truth of the issue. Uh, so I think those things are really important. Um, I think it's important to not always feel like you have to be the one that's right because resolving conflict sometimes means putting your own agenda aside and really hearing and listening to what is being brought to you. And so you can listen fully before making a decision. I think those things are really critical. Um, resolving conflict oftentimes requires someone that's neutral that can help manage if it's really heated. Uh, you bring some a neutral party and that can help manage the conflict too. I actually do a lot of that. I've done a lot of that in my work because many times, and actually I'll be honest, I think um, COVID, we've lost some of the interpersonal skills that we once had. And so people aren't necessarily hearing and listening as well as we once did. So I think it. Um, we're talking to my staff actually about creating a conflict resolution arm to our Office of Student Conduct because we see individual student conflicts rising. We see conflicts between student organizations rising. So I think your question is on point uh, because I think as people have been tucked away and hidden behind masks, learning how to manage interpersonal conflict has become a lost art. So we have to teach the skills for people to be able to do that. Commissioner Wheeler, I, did we miss seven or eight? Okay. Well, uh, eight's kind of the same as six. So it's oh. much the same. Let's just go on to 10. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Abigail Wheeler. I represent district four, which is kind of the west side of Portage. Okay. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you. It's a great day to be a Bronco. It is a great day to be a Bronco. <laughs> um, my question for you is, what is the greatest strength that you will bring to the advisory board? Mm, I think it would be that I really um, know Western Michigan University quite well, and I know our students quite well. So I think I can represent that constituency very well and make sure you, we all are aware of the issues that they bring. I also think that I bring a love and passion for this area and I'm really committed to doing whatever I can to help us thrive as a community. And I see transportation as one of the things that's really an important component of a thriving, healthy community. So I think I bring all of that. I also can tell you that one of my strengths is um, collaboration. I love working across the aisle. I love partnering with people. I do not believe I have all the answers. I don't believe I have many of the answers. And I think working with people together um, with diverse voices, you make much better decisions. So I love being a part of a group that's willing to look at the work from that vantage point. Thank you. Thank you. And do you have any questions for us at all regarding the, the process or the board? We may not be able to answer, but I see Sean back there. I will definitely pick on him if there's a question I'm not able to. Well, what are you looking for from um, a new member to join your ranks? What are you hoping to find in this next candidate? 
you would get nine different answers. Okay. <laughs> um, but I, I, I that's think that's why you asked the question about conflict resolution. Yeah. Right? I, <laughs> but I, I think that that the as as you had described in your answer, sort of the soup of all of our collective ideas is you know usually you know we take more value in that than our own personal sort okay. of opinions. But um, you know everything from you know understanding what what the transit authority does. Um, Commissioner Gisler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've been involved in one fashion or another, even before I became a commissioner, with the transit operation uh, in the county. And I will tell you, in my opinion, the transit group is possibly, it, it's certainly, I don't know if it's the best, but it certainly oh. is not anybody that needs a whole lot of remaking and that sort of thing. I'm very pleased the way it's been done over the years, including now that it's split into Central County Transit and Kalamazoo mm -hmm. County Transit that was largely in response to funding difficulties and seems like it's a good uh, good solution. And when I used to sit with that group, you know, I, I watched it grow and, and watched my knowledge of transit grow. I'm not a big, uh, you know, bus rider myself, but I understand as you just eloquently said, uh, students really need it. There are a mm -hmm. lot of people that do Mm -hmm. use it for getting to jobs and do need it for getting to uh, uh, doctor's appointments right. and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's an essential uh, thing for the county to have if we're going to be a first rate county. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And we, Kalamazoo County was really revolutionary about a decade ago and lobbying the state legislature to come up with a two tiered structure for whether it be line hauler demand service. And that really brought a lot of parity in, you know, the, the cost of this, you know, what's being provided and what's being taxed. And I, I think it's a, it was a, it was a really genius model. And uh, Sean uh, McBride worked really hard on that and now he's running with it. So um, he's, you know, I think this board is pretty much one thing that we can all agree on. I think that most of us believe, uh, if not all of us believe he's doing a great job there. So. Excellent, very good. Any other commissioners? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. your time. I appreciate yours. Thank you. Next week, Gary Sigmund. Thank you. Chair, uh, Gary is online, so Dina will bring him over in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Hello. 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 Thank you for uh, joining us, Gary. Um, if you want to give uh, just a brief, you know, one minute, uh, one and a half minute introduction about yourself, and then uh, we could start with uh, the questions. Thank you, Chair Taylor. My name is Gary Sigmund. I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I uh, moved here about 11 years ago, uh, found the love of my life living in Kalamazoo, and uh, I had the good sense to marry her. So here I am, and uh, I'm a small business owner. I own a, a internet marketing service called SEMC. Um, so I'm a bit of a digital nomad, and I became one a little bit earlier than uh, the people in the last pandemic-induced rush to digital nomadness. Anyhow, that's me. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Commissioner Delu. do you want to jump into the first question? Yes, Commissioner Strebs. I just want to ask if all the members can hear Mr. Sigmund. Can all can everybody hear him? I could hear him, but okay. Okay. Thank, um, thank you, yeah, no problem. We're we're about ninety. We're hearing about ninety percent of you, Gary. If you could speak up a little bit on the questions, we should be able to to get there. But I think we're we're really close. But uh, Commissioner Delu. Hello, Gary. Dale Commissioner Delu. Hello. How are you? <clears throat> Gary, well, what do you, you know about this advisory board and why are you, are you interested in serving on it? Well, the, a lot of the decisions of this board are being fairly public recently. Um, in the news media, we see all sorts of street changing, bike lanes, um, 
there's a lot of feedback on it. I'm an avid bicyclist. And so a lot of these changes are of really big importance to me. I've already tried out some of the, the um, new routes downtown and I've gone out to Grand Junction on my bike link back uh, and getting from West Edge Hill where I live to the, uh, tr the Calhaven Trail is a lot easier with the result of these uh, new changes. I'd like to see more of this. Also foreign travel, has made me aware of the benefits of a really well um, developed mass transportation plan, particularly fond of Nice, France and their tram system. It's amazing how you can get around uh, without any inconvenience and with no car whatsoever. A wonderful thing indeed. And also public transportation has a large role to play in the climate crisis. So uh, whatever I could do to help uh, move that forward, I'm ready, willing and able. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank Commissioner you. Gissler. Thank you, Chair. Excuse me. Uh, Gary, I'm John Gissler. I represent the east and south uh, part of the county. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's District 6. What experience do you have that's related to the work of the advisory board? This could be professional or experience that you have from the community. Nice to meet you, Commissioner. Um, I served on the Edgewater Development Corporation board in Chicago for eight years, and he eventually was the secretary for about the last three that I was uh, participating. So I'm well aware of the dynamics within a, a, a civic board, and, um, I, and you know, just seems like this is a would be a wonderful opportunity to participate. I've also been the communications chair for the Kalamazoo County Democratic Party for the past six years. And I'm currently a community manager for a Facebook group um, that is based on a race class narrative uh, orientation. Thank you. Thank you, You're uh, Thank Mr. You. Mazur. Hi, Wendy Mazur from District 8, uh, Texas, let's see, Schoolcraft and Prairie Run Townships. Uh, share what you have learned from working with people from different cultures. So the race class narrative has proved, you know, demonstrably that uh, the community engagement is increased by explicitly including people of all skin colors and other types of culture. So building consensus through uh, across the board without regard to any kind of defining uh, community segment, really important and really important to be explicit about it. Um, it's also very important to listen to people with other points of view and to understand their view as best that I can. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Ray. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Gary. Um, Tammy Ray, I represent District 1. Um, this one is a two-part question. What training or education have you received in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? Second part, how will you use what you learn in your work with this advisory board. Thank you, Commissioner Ray. Uh, I have actually been trained, retreat formal training as a part of the um, KCDP's executive committee from THRT. So, and we had a, we've had a workshop and uh, that certainly provides a guideline that I hope to bring in any capacity that I do in anything that I get involved with. And that would include this particular board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what do you expect the advisory board authority to give to the community and how can you help the work of the advisory board authority? Well, the board should be giving our community the best possible transportation options to meet both current and future needs. Um, how I could help was, is from my professional experience with online communications. I have extensive, extensive professional experience in a wide variety of online communications, including website development, uh, Google ads, um, Facebook ads, uh, and Twitter. The, the list is, just keeps going on and on. So um, I believe that these things could be very valuable in keeping the community advised of what's going on and receiving information back from the community in order to guide our deliberations. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Pro Tem Hepler. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Gary. I'm Jeff Hepler. I'm the 
representative from District 7, which is the northeast part of the county, um, Cooper, Richland, Ross, and Charleston. Uh, my question tonight is uh, what three things that a member of the advisory board authority should consider? Pleased to meet you, Commissioner Hepler. Um, the three things that I've, I've spoke, specked out here are the following. How will this policy being considered benefit our community at large? How will this policy being considered benefit marginalized members of our community? And finally, are there any hidden costs to the policy being considered? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Gary, Montes Morales, District 3. What must this advisory board authority do or practice to be successful? The one thing that I, I'm going to be a kind of one trick pony here, transparency via open communications. We need to be sure that the community has access to the deliberations and feels like they have a voice in what is transpiring. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Strebs, and I think we can skip eight. It's the exact same thing as six. So. Yes, thank you, Chair. As I got us off track, uh, we will skip that one. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Sigmund. It's good to see you again. Um, so sure our Strebs. question for you now is how do you handle and resolve conflicts? So interesting and very open-ended uh, question. And I have a two-part answer depending on the circumstances. In a group like this, uh, I seek the opinion of others as to the best way to fix the problem. And so building a consensus is very important. And I will reach out to as many people as I possibly can that are involved or around the situation, as well as people outside the situation to advise me on how to take action. Um, however, in a conflict like a street fight, I try to knock my opponent out as quickly as possible. <laughs> Commissioner Wheeler. Hi, Gary. I'm Abigail Wheeler, uh, the commissioner for District 4. And my question for you is, what is the greatest strength that you will bring to the advisory board? This one I'm very adamant about. I'm very good at getting stuff done. Okay, so that's that's what I will do is get stuff done. Do you have, uh, Gary, thank you very much. Do you have any questions for us or the board at all on, on the process or the authority or? Well, it'd be interesting to, to see exactly what, I mean, is, do you now, once you listen to all the candidates, do you then take a vote in this body mm -hmm. and that's what determines, I mean, what is the process? Well, I think after we hear from all the candidates and there'll be a discussion amongst the commissioners, and then they'll, um, based on the discussion, there'll be a motion um, at the next meeting, or is it going to be at the seven o'clock tonight? It'll be at the next meeting. Yeah, based on the discussion. So our decision would be finalized in two weeks from today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And thank you very much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciated. You're welcome. Next on the um, interview list is Isaiah. I don't have my Isaiah Williams. Thank you, Vice Chair. She's she's keeping me honest here. Um, is he in the audience or via Zoom? Chair, I believe that uh, he actually uh, canceled tonight, so that okay. will conclude the interviews. Okay. Can... Well, that will conclude the interviews. Um, I open it up for discussion from this board. I'm looking at Jen because she always leads us off well. Uh, Commissioner Strebs. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify for our members, the Board Appointments Committee moved these candidates forward. Um, the three uh, applicants we were going to consider are for two vacancies which are available. So one uh, ending December of 24 and the other that goes through December of 25. So I just wanted to clarify that. And then I'd like to ask administration, did Mr. Um, Williams um, express interest, uh, future interest in the position or did he give a, a reason why uh, he was unable to be with us tonight? Are we aware? 
Yes, just give me a moment. I just need to read the email. One moment. Okay, yes, yeah, so it appears that he would, uh, he just had to cancel for today, but would love to reschedule. So still interested in the position. Well, seeing that um, we can either make a decision now or we can wait uh, two weeks to re reschedule and then hear from all, all candidates and then, and then make a decision after that. That would be the board's preference to wait until, I mean, it be, probably would be unfair to have a discussion until we hear from everybody. Um, is that the board's prerogative? Okay, we're moving on. Uh, Sean. Good evening, commissioners. Since the um, agenda went out, there's actually been one other KCTA board member that has resigned to uh, leave the area. So there are three openings. So um, we'd love to fill the positions as soon as possible. Duly noted. Commissioner Hepler. Thank you, Chair. Um, based on the information that we've just been provided, uh, I see no reason why we couldn't move ahead with the two that we've already interviewed and fill the third seat uh, after the next interview, unless there's some objection. Commissioner Shrebs. Um, well, just one thing I'll share for the commissioners to consider the typically when a new position comes up and we open it back up for community um, opportunity to apply. So there may be additional candidates that come forward for now the third available position. Um, so considering that, you know, we might want to not just assume the three before us would move into seats. Um, so we could take that into advisement. Certainly, you know, if we're interested in all three, we can consider that third person for the other uh, position and not have to re-interview them. I'm looking for input from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Gissler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I understood Jen correctly, uh, we're not gonna take advantage of the fact that in my estimation, we've got two beautiful candidates already here that turned in their applications and showed up for the, the interviews. And I'm not saying anything nasty about Mr. Williams, but I'd like to see, I'm sure Sean would too, uh, get those two that were just interviewed on board and then worry about the third place later. I've got a question for Sean. Um, are we, is it now that we've got three openings, are you going to run into quorum issues? No. Okay. Big committees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, looking for input. Uh, Vice Chair Ray. Thank you. Um, I'll just say that I, I agree with the comments of Commissioner Stratz. I think um, we chose through some applicants to, to move these three forward for interviews. So there are obviously other people interested. So I like to see us go through the process and post the opening and have everybody go through the process like everyone else, and then wait to have this discussion after we interview Mr. Williams. Thank you. Any other discussion? Well, I will say the first interview we got, um, she knocked my socks off. She was good. Um, that was that was her answers were, were spot on. Um, I very rarely do I get impressed with these things, but she was good. Um, but if we want to wait as a board, I, I'm perfectly okay with that as well. Okay, I get my back to yeah, yes, uh, corporate counsel. Uh, if the chair may, corporate counsel would like to offer some unsolicited legal advice. <laughs> I am always in for free legal advice. <laughs> it's not free. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, I just wanted to note for the board that under the board's newly adopted bylaws, uh, during the committee of the whole, you're supposed to make a motion and approve it to move to the next regular meeting if you're gonna defer the decision. However, uh, no one is prohibited from making a motion, uh, obtaining a second and passing the appointment of someone uh, out of this committee based on how they're written, so. The chair will entertain a motion to move the uh, decision on appointing for the transit authority to our next regularly scheduled board meeting. It has been moved and supported. Any discussion?
next regular <laughs> next regular committee of the whole meeting i apologize commissioner delu he is absolutely correct yeah technically he is correct so it would would the chair would you guys like to we'd have to drop that motion uh corporate council and start over or would someone like to move to amend it i, I guess i'm i would ask i'm not quite clear on what occurred there i thought under the bylaws we would do it comes to the committee of the whole and then you make a motion second and you move that to the next regular meeting of the board of commissioners the, the problem was um as commissioner delu uh duly noted i made the entertained a motion to move it to the next regularly scheduled board meeting, which would be the seven o'clock meeting in an hour or two from now, oh. as opposed to the next committee of the whole meeting. Would that require a new motion and um, the motion that's currently on the floor have to be removed or? You have to deal with it. So you have to vote it down or amend it. Okay, the chair will entertain an amendment to the motion to make it the next committee of the whole meeting. All right, it's been amended by Commissioner Morales and supported by Commissioner Gisler. Any dis oh, Commissioner Hepler. <laughs> Any discussion? We are voting on just the amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? All right, the amendment has passed. Now we're on the original motion um, to move this to the next committee of the whole. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. All right. We got it done. Next up is review of accounts payable and payroll disbursements. Administrator Catlin. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chairs, and uh, Commissioner's audience. Uh, this evening, we have uh, an accounts payable uh, claims list totaling $3,684,860.87. Of this total, the board is asked to approve claims totaling $3,283,675.44. We have uh, payroll disbursements totaling $2,456,996.58 for the March 15th, March 17th, and March 31st payrolls. Happy to entertain any questions. Questions from commissioners? Seeing none, we are moving right along to business priorities. Review of budget policies from 2023. Um, do you want me to jump in on this, Kevin, or do you want to? Okay. So um, as some of you that have been watching a lot of meetings are aware, um, we are going to take a look at a couple of our budget policies, each and every committee of the whole, so we can get a better understanding of how our budget is put together and how it works when we go through our uh, budget process for 2024. And if we are, you know, entertain the idea of opening up our 2023 budget as well. And I thought we'd start with a couple easy ones, um, ones that probably wouldn't be that time consuming, seeing as how we have a full agenda tonight. Um, the alcohol tax, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because state statute has changed. So we're going to need to change this uh, policy anyway to reflect the new distribution by state statute. Um, it's no longer a 50-50 split. It's now a 60-40 split, and then the, then the pie is a little bit bigger. But um, I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to read these. And then the second one might be a little bit more um, in-depth, and I've just talked with a bunch of commissioners in the last week or so about this policy, and Commissioner Strebs had an interesting take um, on how we can feed ourselves um, literally um, at meetings and have um, something to eat in between meetings. Um, but we had a county policy that did not allow coffee or food, um, which seemed onerous, um, but uh, seemed a little bit strict. But um, I guess you wanna take us through the first one, um, alcohol tax. Yes, Chair, uh, Vice Chairs and Commissioners and uh, audience. So this evening, uh, we can take a look at the alcohol tax. And this is a, uh, a policy uh, that was adopted uh, back in 2018 and uh, was effective in uh, January 2019. The alcohol tax uh, is to be amended because uh, as of December 31st, 2022, the governor signed uh, two Senate bills, 1222 and 1223. Uh, these bills amended state statute. Uh, in turn, representing a 48% uh, percent increase in state shared revenue on the liquor uh, uh, tax collections. Uh, previously, 50% of this revenue could be used in uh, the general fund, and then 50% uh, had to be uh, used for uh, substance abuse. 
uh, as the chair uh, stated, the uh, bill now calls for 40% to go towards substance abuse, 60% can go towards general fund. However, the allocation for 2023 uh, cannot be, for substance abuse cannot be less than what it was in 2022. So uh, essentially we, we cannot go down to the 40% uh, mark for uh, substance abuse in that regard. So uh, the numbers that I include in the packet, this would represent for the general fund, uh, an increase of about 125,000. So our uh, allocation last year for the general fund and what's programmed into the 2023 budget is 665,000. Well, now that will be $790,000. And then substance abuse was also 665,000, uh, but that would now, um, actually the numbers I gave you were backwards. So the $790,000 numbers for substance abuse, that's a $125,000 increase. The general fund, uh, would increase uh, to 1.1 million from 665,000. Uh, so that's a $520,000 increase to the general fund. We typically receive uh, liquor tax uh, collections in thirds, uh, typically one payment in May, one payment in August, and one payment in November. So we haven't received any uh, increase yet, but the governor did sign those bills and we're expecting to receive those. So what we would do with this policy to align it to state statute is that we'll have the finance department uh, draft uh, an amended policy for the board to review at their next regularly scheduled meeting for approval. I think that's a that's an easy one. I mean, we need to be in compliance with state statute. <laughs> but um, are there any commissioners that have questions on this particular uh, budget policy? All right, moving on to the next one, uh, determining lawful expenditures. Yes, Chair, uh, Vice Chair's Commissioner's audience. So uh, this policy is being reviewed. Uh, board leadership wanted to uh, have this policy addressed as, as Chair stated um, in regards to uh, looking at how uh, the board can uh, purchase food for certain gatherings, uh, meetings, and so on and so forth. We had uh, legal counsel. So Angelina looked at this as corporation counsel in uh, Although we have not been able to conduct a very thorough review of this yet, uh, we can we have some preliminary information to share and I'll turn it over to Corporation Council to, to uh, highlight some of those findings. Please. Chair, um, it's my determination that um, the county would only be able to make such expenditures uh, and to have them be lawful if it is authorized by the Michigan Constitution and state statute. Um, there isn't a provision in the constitution or state statute that would allow the expenditure on things for a non-public purpose so you have to apply the public purpose test uh, which relies on uh, case law so one of the tests for that is whether the expenditure confers a direct benefit of a reasonably general character on a significant part of the public um, and so just because the public can attend the meeting and partake doesn't necessarily confer a significant benefit on them if the majority of the partakers in the food purchased are actually uh, county electeds or employees. Um, so in general, um, you can't spend on employee parties and gifts or these food type items. Um, and there's also other components of that test under Wayne County v. Uh, Hathcock, which talks about it has to be the, for the promotion of health, safety, morals, general welfare, security, prosperity of the residents in uh, the corporation. And so it would be my preliminary uh, legal opinion that the county cannot use public funds uh, to provide food for the meetings. Now, you, you're, are you reading off the uh, attorney general's opinion? Okay, the attorney general's opinion, um, in my understanding, provides um, exceptions for long meetings, um, hours, working past, yada, yada. But I, you know, I, uh, Commissioner Strebs, if you want to add on to that. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Council, the, the current policy does cite AG opinion from uh, 2005, I'm sorry, 2002, uh, last posted in 2005 uh, as a reference to the policy. When I reviewed that document, um, there's sort of uh, two segments which our internal policy addresses. The first is coffee and food. And in the language in the AG's opinion, it does note, and, and here again, we're just talking about like basic coffee in an office for staff. Um, it does note that those cannot be used for uh, you know, a, a private person, per, purpose rather, unless they are a conferred fringe benefit. And so there is a potential for us um, 
to make a minor revision uh, to benefits that we can allow coffee uh, for employees. Um, I didn't find any language like that related to entitlement recognitions or, or parties, but it does expressly note language in fringe benefits and through collective bargaining that it could be allowed. Um, recognizing that uh, noted exception, it if it's food or a meal, it becomes a taxable expense. So the idea that we're going to tax employees on food that we provide with public funds, um, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, it's going to sort of outweigh the benefits. Snacks, uh, there is tax and IRS guidance on that being a de minimis component. Um, so snack and coffee, it's possible, but we have to have a, a verified and adopted fringe benefit policy. Um, and so, you know, we'd want to look further into that and research it additionally. Any comments? Uh, Commissioner Gissler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe I don't understand the uh, breadth of the question, but if we're talking about uh, on, on an extended meeting, and we've had a few of those, uh, or maybe just a break between the four o'clock and the seven o'clock, uh, we're making more money, each of us, than we did a year ago. Why don't you just dock each of our pay checks 10 bucks a month or 10 bucks a, a, a week or whatever it's going to work out to so that we don't have to get into this kind of nonsense to have coffee and pizza or coffee. And for those of us that know a donut when they see it, um, you know, I think we're maybe making bigger issue out of this than we need to. Is what I'm saying. Thank I, you. I, I agree with you to a point. I, I think it's more than just us as commissioners. I'm looking at the morale of of, of uh, county employees when they're when they're doing work meetings. Now, my under my interpretation, and I went back and looked at the attorney general's opinion. My interpretation was, if you were working after hours um, and you, you went through lengthy meetings, that it would perfectly it would be perfectly allowed for us here one um i don't know how much of a we we apply as employees per se but I, you know i i have no problem and i have no problem putting in you know chipping in to do it each time i think it makes us more productive but um other you know uh, board of canvassers or other groups that are meeting all day long um, um advisories or, or citizen groups um i think not providing them the opportunity to I mean, other municipalities are doing it. If we take this letter of this law to the point that we should not have glasses of water provided by the county or tissues for our nose, or I mean, we can we can take this to an extreme if we wanted to. And I, you know, I, I think we're getting to the point. And I'm I'm just using this policy as sort of a point of proving the kind of the ridiculousness of our policies and the strictness of where we've gotten in the budgetary of where we are today by just being so rigid in, in our interpretation of, of the law and not looking at it from an outside perspective or kind of a, maybe more of a rational type of how do we get from point A to point B, not how do we follow the, the line. Um, but that's, that's it's more of a philosophical question. But do we have any um, uh, other commissioners that would like to comment on this? Commissioner Gissler. Thank you again, Chair. Uh, you go back longer than I do, and so does Jeff. When I first joined the board in uh, 2011, I don't know if we had a hat that was passed or, or what, but we basically ponied up for our own snacks and, and coffee, and it was, I think, mainly coffee. It wasn't a lot. We had a coffee fund and then a food fund, and I think Dina ran that, and Gosh, I don't want to put that on no, her didn't again. Have anything else to do? So yeah. You know. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. It was. Sometimes it was very onerous. Um, I'm certainly happy to work with um, you know staff and work with administration to make sure that we're going to be fed every meeting. I don't. I don't see that as a problem. I think that makes us more productive, and in the long run, it's better for the county. Um, but you know, I mean, if 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 it's push comes to shove, I think it's at the, the purview of this board if we want to, you know, take a look at this further or how do, how do we want to proceed on this? Um, are we okay with policy being as it as it states? Or do we is this something that this commission wants to, to look farther into? I mean, it's it's but the, the, the gist of it is it's up to the nine of us. So 
Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. So I would like to look further into it. I know those border canvassers, some days they are here like a very long time. And I personally have made sure that they are fed or need coffee or whatever they need. Um, so I am in favor of, even if, I mean, I can buy my own food without Gisler's remark of trying to deduct it out my check. But, <laughs> but if it's for the betterment of our employees and can help them function better, and the fact that we can't always think that people have it. We have so many food insecurities within our communities, even with people that work 40 hours a week that may not be able to afford an extra meal while they're at work. So I would be um, in support of moving forward with this. Any other? How about this? How about I come back with, and I work with Angelina and see if um, I could come back with a recommendation maybe in the next board meeting or two, and I'll put this on and figure out a way, whether it's a fringe benefit or if, you know, I, we, we take 10 bucks or 15 bucks out of everybody's check, but I really think we got to, and that's just, that just solves our problem. It doesn't solve like the, all the other boards and authorities and long hours that are worked here and, and really, you know, how we treat our employees. I mean, it comes down to that. I mean, I don't want to break the law, but we've, we've got to start thinking outside the box and start thinking of not process driven, but results driven. And so that's, that's where I'm at. But um, I'm happy to bring this back to the board in a, in a couple of meetings or so. Which moves us up. Oh, sorry, any other questions from commissioners? All right, seeing none, that moves us to business priorities, uh, mental health, or no, employees, um, Commissioner or Administrator Catlin. Yes, thank you, Chair, Vice Chairs, Commissioners, audience. Uh, the uh, the uh, update that I have to share uh, for you all tonight uh, is regarding the, uh, the status of uh, county employees that were or are being compensated less than $15 an hour. And so we determined that those were uh, seasonal employees. So we rectified an issue within the parks department last meeting to uh, compensate those employees, seasonal workers, uh, at least $15 an hour. Uh, we were able to determine that there were, uh, looks like we have five additional employees uh, that were affected. Uh, so seasonal employees, again, uh, four relief worker positions that were uh, in the uh, juvenile home. Uh, so that would cost uh, an estimated cost of up to $5,163 on the high end. Uh, the general fund contribution uh, would be 25, almost $2,600. And then uh, the other half of that's reimbursable by the child care fund. And then there's also uh, a, an, an airport intern uh, with an estimated cost up to $6,400. $62 on the high end, and that cost would be borne by the uh, airport as it is an enterprise unit. So uh, we can uh, certainly make those changes if there's a motion uh, to uh, have these five employees, uh, seasonal employees uh, compensated at $15 an hour, we can make those changes. Commissioner Streps. Thank you, Chair. Administrator, uh, in public comment at our last session, Sheriff elevated a couple of other positions that are not compensated at $15 an hour uh, as well. He talked about the potential blending of two positions to resolve that issue. Um, junior, cook. junior Cook was a Junior Cook's position. So uh, staff would need time, I guess, to research that. Uh, we met with HR and did not determine any other employees other than the uh, employees I just highlighted tonight to be compensated under $15 an hour, but I can have staff go back and look into that. Do you have another follow-up? Vice Chair Ray? I was just gonna make a motion. I'm looking around for, okay. Do you want to make them? Yeah, I'll, I'll make your motion. Oh. $15 an hour. All right. The motion made by uh, uh, Vice Chair Ray and supported by Commissioner Morales was to um, make those four or five, five positions 
um, increase to $15 an hour to be paid fr from, go ahead. I apologize, Chair. If if we could have that motion amended, HR is recommending that uh, the motion include that it's retroactive to January first, twenty twenty three. The HR has recommended retroactivity. <laughs> That's blowing my mind. <laughs> So, 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 so the idea is right. So we implemented a wage study that was effective January first, twenty twenty three. So we're recommending that if these employees are to be compensated at fifteen dollars an hour, that it is retroactive to January first, twenty twenty three. So this is cost of. Yes. Yes. That. Yeah. That would be included in the in the cost. All right, there is a motion on the floor, and then now we are talking about the amendment of the motion to include retroactivity. Um, I will just say I will be voting for the motion. I will not be voting for retroactivity. I think that puts us down a very slippery slope. Um, I, I would like to get more advice from, from legal. I, I'm shocked that, that, that we're recommending retroactivity. I mean, that's been my whole career as a county commissioner is that that word is scares people sometimes but um you know especially when it comes to bargaining negotiations when you when you when you in, uh, initiate retroactivity within wage studies or compensation you open up the door during during bargaining negotiations and bargaining discussions and i'm a labor guy um but you you really open up the door during contracts to um allow that to seep into negotiation process with union employees so I, I will be voting no on the retroactivity portion of it, but if it passes, I will still be supporting the motion. Commissioner Gissler. Thank you, Chair. I will join you in following your lead. Uh, retroactivity is something that I'm not sure we have any idea how ugly that can get. Uh, I've been sitting over here waiting to see our corporate counsel lift off her chair and she hasn't done it yet, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll follow your lead chair. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Ray. Can we hear from Angelina her thoughts on this? I would love to. Uh, chair, Vice Chair, I would need uh, additional time and opportunity to review the matter. I just don't have enough information to opine at this time. That's fair. Uh, uh, Com Commissioner DeLue, right now we are discussing only the motion to amend on the retroactivity um, portion of it, correct? Corporate counsel? Yes. Uh, Commissioner DeLue. Well, since we're discussing an amendment, can't, in the amendment, can't we include, because I think there are other employees, like they said at the Sheriff's Department, I'm pretty sure that there's cook positions are not making $15 an hour. Can we just include them now or do we have to come back and vote on them again later? What we could do is we could make a motion to table all the original motions indefinitely and start over. Or we can vote. I mean, right now we are we have on the floor a motion, uh, an amend, amendment to a motion. So we'd have to take care of that amendment to the motion, then the motion first, and then we'd be able to proceed. Uh, Vice Chair Ray. Thank you, Chair. So I have a question. I guess it's not really related to the amendment. And maybe I should wait to ask the question. I'll express a lot of leniency. <laughs> I appreciate it. So I feel like we've had this discussion before that we wanted to move all employees to $15 an hour. And then there was, so now we've been discussing the seasonal employees. So I don't know where all these other folks are coming out the woodwork. So if we can get everybody or all the numbers for all the employees who are not there and then discuss it at one time, I think that would be great. I feel like we've had this discussion so many times. Yeah, I think what Commissioner Catlin went and, and came back with those five positions. Um, what Commissioner Delu and correct me if I'm wrong with this intent, but your thought was um, just in case that something got missed, that that motion would cover everybody so we wouldn't have to go through this one more time. Am I correct in that assumption? Okay, yeah, so I think we're, it's more of a like, yeah, there's these five positions, but just in case there's something else that pops up. Commissioner Streps. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to inquire uh, from Council if we table the motions in hand indefinitely, um, bringing them forward in the same session, I believe, is out of order in Robert's rules because then it's presenting 
or they would be it would be worded differently okay if there is room for us to do that i'd like us not to delay further if if retroactivity will not be considered potentially by the board uh, pay raises need to move forward as soon as possible then um, so i would not uh, like to delay um, but i also speak you know working in uh, quasi governmental nonprofit sector um, for staff members making poverty wages for years um, retroactive pay was something that had to be utilized once funding sources were determined. Uh, people making under $15 an hour um, are struggling deeply. Um, and so, you know, I know in the juvenile home, I'm not sure if these uh, or if the affected staff that the uh, administrator has have brought forward are in collective bargaining agreements. All I, I understand we don't uh, want to open difficulty through that process. Uh, but if they are not, I would encourage us to consider a pay raise back to the first, like everyone else got. Okay, we have a motion for an amendment to the original motion to include retroactivity. Um, once we get rid of that, for, or if we do pass it or if we don't pass it, then I think that would be the appropriate time, uh, Commissioner Delu, to make your amendment to include all. But I think we need to take care of this, for, vote on up or down this first one first, if that makes sense. Um, Clerk Cox, we are. Um, this is a motion to amend the um, previous motion to include retroactivity. Uh, will you take roll, please? Commissioner Delu. Yes. Commissioner Gisler. No. Vice Chair Hepler. No. Commissioner Mazur. No. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Vice Chair Ray. Yes. Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. No. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. That's five yes, four no. Okay, we have an motion on the floor that includes retroactivity. So um, if uh, Commissioner DeLue, is this the, the time you wanted to uh, make an amendment to include all positions just in case something slipped through? Correct. I, I, instead of just seasonal employees, I think I should just say all employees. Well, I think he has all employees, but I think what you were talking about, like the cook or some other Correct. position that may have squeaked through if he finds one, then it would also be included and added on to these five employees. Am I, is that understanding correctly, Kevin? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I guess I'd say that. So we had the Human Resources Department uh, provide information to finance, and, and we determined that there were five employees. And so in the interest of uh, trying to um, elevate inclusivity, so our, our HR department and uh, specifically leadership there uh, it really raised the, uh, the, the the concern to retroactivity as the as you recall the market study really called for uh, there's an equity piece in there and so um, trying to uh, uh, ensure that uh, we we implement an equitable process I think that's where the equity or the uh, uh, the retro piece came in uh, as it stands today what I uh, was provided with from HR uh, in, in finance were five employees. We will certainly go back to ensure that there are no other employees that are being compensated less than $15 an hour, but um, in the interest of equity, I think that's why the retro piece was lifted up and, and, and uh, administration supports that. Okay. Are you comfortable without the motion or would yeah, you rather? So it doesn't sound like my, my amendment is necessary. Okay. Sounds good. So now we have the original motion on the floor. Um, Clerk, will you take roll, please? Commissioner Gisler. It still includes retroactivity, right? I vote no, thank you. Vice Chair Hepler. I vote no. Commissioner Mazur. No. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Vice Chair Ray. Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Six yes, three no. 
All right, that takes us out of business priorities, employees. Now we're business priorities, mental health, substance abuse. Uh, Kevin. Yes, thank you, Chair, Vice Chairs and Commissioners. Uh, this evening, I'll actually uh, pass this to uh, Deputy Administrator Warner. She's been uh, leading the task on, uh, in partnership uh, with uh, Corporation Council and in other uh, uh, leadership within the county. And so she's going to provide an update on uh, opioid settlements and uh, potential metrics. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening. I provided uh, the majority of my update in the packet for you this evening, um, but I will, for the purpose of the meeting, just kind of hit some. I'll move my phone and then I will hit some highlights. Um, so we've had we, we've received a lot of questions and I know we've received some public comment time too regarding the opioid settlements and where we are. Um, to date at this point in time, we have received three settlements, uh, the distributor, Jansen and Meyer. The majority of what I will be chatting about uh, is really regarding the uh, requirements that are under um, the, the agreements for distributor and uh, Jansen. Um, but I'll just kind of go through all of it. So we are anticipating to receive five more uh, settlement agreements, um, those opportunities coming in for the county to opt into those. Um, we believe that will be forthcoming throughout this year. Um, I think it is important to, to mention that the distribution process requirements on spending and reporting may differ between all of these settlement agreements. Um, at this point in time, like I said, the distributor and Jansen are both very similar. Um, there are some differences between those two, but they're very similar. Um, once those additional agreements come forward, that's where we really will be doing the work to look through and read through um, what, are the, what are the particulars with those requirements and that funding that's being received. Uh, to date, like I said, we have received the distributor, which uh, in the amount I'm just going to round is $323,000. This is payment one and two out of uh, anticipated uh, maximum, maximum number of payments of 18. Uh, for the Janssen payment, we received $958,731. Again, rounding, I'm not including the cents. Um, those are uh, for five payments, and we're anticipating nine payments total for them. At this point in time, we have not received the Meyer settlement yet. Uh, we believe that's going to be a lump sum payment, and that's about at $1.5 million. But again, that payment has not been received at this time. So for the rest of this uh, update to you guys, this is really going to be focusing again on the distributor and Janssen settlement agreements. I do want to point out, um, you know, there are some pretty strict requirements regarding the funding. 85% uh, of the funds are required to be spent on opioid remediation, uh, with 70% of those funds used for future opioid rem remediation. So as we're really considering what is going to be our planning process, um, what is going to be our distribution process, those are two percentages that we need to keep in mind. It's not for a particular year, but it's over the lifetime of all the funding that's being received. The county is gonna be required to report out on any non-opioid re remediation expenses that we have. We're actually required to report that out twice a year. Um, and both of those settlements, uh, you know, the focus really is on care treatment and prevention. Uh, they do outline, and this is included in the packet, um, what they refer to as, as Exhibit E, which is a non-exhaustive list of expendi expenditures that could qualify as being part of opioid remediation. This list is divided into two categories, one being for core strategies and the other for approved uses for treatment, prevention, and other strategies, with the priority truly being on core strategies. I think this is an excellent document uh, for anyone that's interested in the opioid settlements and what could be potentially where the focus is uh, from the Board of Commissioners of where you're going to allocate funding of uh, reviewing this list and um, some really great details and examples provided in there as well. Um, that brings us to where we have been and the work that we've been doing. So right now, the county is in the planning process. Uh, basically, what I've been doing is researching best practices, 
uh, communicating with, our, with other counties and communicating with municipalities within our county on uh, the settlements that they're receiving, their plans, and um, wh what their thoughts are at this point in time. Uh, the Michigan Associ Association of Counties does have a technical advisor that I've been uh, communicating with, and this person specifically is advising based off of funds planning and capacity mm -hmm. building. I think what's important for us to realize with this funding is it's not just what are we doing today with it, but what are we doing for future years? And again, going back to that 70% of future opioid remediation. So I think there, there's a value and a need to really take um, some time to uh, plan out what our process is going to be and not just for year one, but for all future years. Uh, MAC, the resources have been fantastic there to date. They have provided us a toolkit, templates for spending plans and budgets, annual reports. Um, we are anticipating additional templates for, me uh, for metrics and evaluation tools. Those have not been released yet. They're anticipating that release to be sometime in April or May. Um, again, I think that, that those tools are going to be important to see, especially as we're considering how we're funding to make sure that we're clearly communicating to the people that may be receiving those funds, whether that's internal departments or community partners, of what the expectations are for those metrics as we look at how we're going to be reporting back to our community of how uh, this funding is being used. Um, I've also uh, put our, our name in the hat, if you will, uh, for being interested in technical assistance for a community needs assessment. This is uh, through MDHHS and, and University Technical Assistance Collaborative. I don't have any information more than just saying, yes, our county would possibly be interested in a community needs assessment. Um, I would anticipate receiving more information again forthcoming sometime in the May, June, July time period for that. Uh, so to date, also what I've been doing is conducting meetings with our health officer, our medical director, our prosecuting attorney, and our sheriff to discuss what our internal and historical work regarding opioid remediation. I've kept these meetings uh, just internal to county without knowing where the board's really wanting to go and, uh, and where you may be wanting to be funding. Um, you know, that could impact, you know, community partners that, uh, that you also choose to maybe allocate funds to. So I have been meeting uh, with this group primarily. Um, you know, these meetings have provided some feedback and input regarding the work that has occurred through the Opioid Coalition. Um, specifically, I'm mentioning the Kalamazoo County Opioid Coalition, which is coordinated by ISK, um, Diane Sh uh, Schaefer in particular, and then Dr. Nettleton, our medical director for, for Kalamazoo County. Um, in unison with other uh, community partners, uh, since either these uh, four individuals or their staff may also attend some of these coalition meetings too. Uh, basically where we are, this is where we are in the planning process. Um, this is the information I have at this date. Um, I think it is important for the Board of Commissioners to start thinking about um, what you want to see from, from this funding. We are receiving significant amount of funds um, that has been needed in our community. Our community has been impacted by uh, opioids and considering you know, where we want to go with it. So um, we do need to keep in mind, again, what is that mechanism that we're going to use, um, what process we're going to have in place, um, if funds are going to be ex uh, expended internally and or out to community partners, what metrics and evaluation tools we want to have so we set those expectations at the very beginning. Um, and I think that we do also need to keep in mind, too, as far as within county, um, administering, monitoring, and reporting any of the funding expensed um, through the opioid settlements that is going to um, hit in a variety of ways, especially if we're looking at um, funding opportunities to community partners, um, who is going to be at the county level overseeing this um, granting process, who is processing the invoices, all of those uh, uh, things that go along with doing county business. 
So essentially that is my update for y'all tonight. Um, you know, the planning process is ongoing. I anticipate having more information even within the next month. Um, I think I wrote in here, I'd be meeting with uh, our internal group later this month and, uh, and actually I met with them today. So I apparently was a few weeks off on my calendar when I originally wrote this far. Um, but I, I do uh, hope that we have an opportunity and believe that we'll have an opportunity at the April 18th meeting of, of the Cal to provide another update to this group of where we are on that internal process and any of the additional updates I have. Um, so I will be requesting uh, some time for a potential update at that Cal. Um, if so desired by the board. Um, but at this time, I will pause and see if y'all have any questions for me. Um, I have just a couple of quick uh, comments or, and or questions. Um, one, I heard you at the end talk about, you know, the, the cost of the grant writers and that sort. So, so are we going to be taking a central service or being able to take a central service percentage off this opioid dollar amount, the 10% traditional 10% or whatever we take? Um, th that will be something uh, that we'll need to look at again, whenever the two settlement agreements that we're looking at right now, I, I'm going to just say 85%, one's technically 85%, the other one's 84.5%. Okay. <laughs> so uh, have to be used for opioid remediation. Mm -hmm. The other 15%, I think is at the discretion of this board. You do have to report out twice a year, mm -hmm. any uh, specifically, um, you need to report out any non-opioid remediation expenses so that anything that we choose in that 15% category, we would need to be reporting out twice a year on uh, how we expended those funds. And that would be the same sort of reporting structure we do for pretty much any state grant where we took the central service cost off of it, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and how much um, um, allocation or how many dollars have we currently received? I know we got the Meyer settlement. Um, I know we're expecting a lot more, but I guess how much is sitting in our, you know, in our bank account, opioid right now, account. Yes. Um, I, you know, I came really close to adding these two bullets together and then I decided not to do it. Um, but if you, if you add together the, uh, 323 and the nine, 958,000, I mean, that brings us just a little bit over a million that we've received at this point in time. Um, again, that's just two payments out of 18 from the distributor and five payments out of nine from Janssen. Um, so so I would say right now, it's a little over a million that we have without sure. doing the math. Um, and then of course, we are still waiting to receive. We believe it's gonna be a lump sum payment. We just haven't received it yet of the 1.5 million uh, from the Meyer settlement. And we're currently collecting interest until a plan is formulated on those dollars, correct? Well, that'd be up to a treasurer. Okay. Um, well, any questions from commissioners? Um, commission, well, I, before I even go to Commissioner Stravitz, because I want to say what, I do think that this board should have more input um, in this process. I mean, we're going to be looking at just adding it all together at the end of, you know, after all these payments, we're going to be approaching over $10 million in, um, in, in that's a substantial investment in this community. And, and I don't know if I said this, so I just want to make sure I, I do say this. So when we look at the percentages, the 85%, and then even that 70% 70, 70 for future opioid remediation, that is over the whole span of all the money that we uh -huh. receive, not um, what we allocate if we choose to allocate something in year one or year two, or it's not by calendar year, it's by lifetime of those funds. But I, I would certainly recommend to the board, it'd be best budget practice to keep those percentages year after year, instead of trying to get to year 10 and trying to make the math work. Yeah. Um, it, that's, it would certainly make sense to try to keep those percentages on an ongoing budgetary. Uh, Commissioner DeLue. Since we've already started receiving funds, is there a date we have to get moving on this or do they, there's no time we have, have to have things in place by? No. Commissioner Streps. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to uh, Deputy Administrator for the work that you've been doing on this and appreciate it and look forward to the future updates. I just wanted to elevate just a couple of perspectives. Um, you mentioned the tools the MAC provided, and um, I just wanna encourage you to look to NACO's tools as well. Uh, there were a number of 
um, educational sessions at the national conference. Um, very hot issue across the country. And there's a lot of other counties who are taking creative approaches that we might be able to learn from there. So for your reference, the other is that uh, through the process, similar to as we approached in uh, housing and, and gun violence, I'd like us to think through ways that we can gather a broader community input about what they see uh, the approaches would need, need to be community listening sessions um, or other cert, such approaches. And that might help inform our institutional partners about maybe gaps in our own uh, processes or services that maybe we haven't seen because of our internal perspective. Thank you. Any other commissioners? I, just from my one perspective, I, I think a hybrid approach, I know you guys are very early in this process, but where you look at both internal um, processes, uh, whether it be the you know infant mortality or uh, uh, things that we, the county, can do is currently doing that that we can continue to do and maybe do better and then there's things that we don't do that we probably are going to need to look for third party um, vendors or th uh, sources that that's all they they do whether it be in an addiction uh, so we can look for partners within the community for part of that as well so I, I think a hybrid approach makes the most sense from my perspective but thank you very much thank you all right, next up, we have um, any other items discussions on purchase agreements for parking lots. And we have a presentation, um, a group of uh, individuals. Thank you so much. I'll uh, start with you, Jonas, um, if you wanna introduce. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Ellison with Catalyst Development, and I'm excited to announce that for the benefit of Southwest Michigan, Catalyst Development is proposing to build a new state-of-the-art 320,000 square foot arena and vent center in downtown Kalamazoo. This would be a totally privately funded project with no taxpayer funding involved. To make this project happen, Catalyst is requesting that the county approve the sale of the remaining land necessary for Catalyst to move forward with the project. Commissioners and the materials we have provided you are the proposed terms for the land purchase, which include the following main terms. One, purchase price for the land, 4,270,000. Second, Catalyst will provide the county sufficient time and flexibility to meet its parking needs as currently provided by the surface parking lot located at 411 West Kalamazoo Avenue. This includes allowing the county to continue to use the surface parking lot for a period of 24 months after closing free of charge. If after the 24 month period has expired and the county has not secured alternative parking, then it will have the option to lease up to 300 spaces and a new ramp to be built by Catalyst as part of the project. Three, Catalyst will support the strategic goals as set forth in Imagine Kalamazoo 2025 by making the following commitments. Catalyst will assist in workforce development initiatives through a specific Greenleaf Hospitality Group program for recruitment, training, and employment to encourage and assist residents within the NACD targeted neighborhoods to gain employment in the hospitality, entertainment, and sports management sectors. Catalyst will set aside 20% of all food and beverage concession space in the event center to be occupied and operated by historically underrepresented people who reside within the area served by NACD. Catalyst will require all contractors wishing to bid on the project to have current policies and practices in place that demonstrate their commitment to increasing diversity within their respective organizations. Catalyst will work with NACD, Southwest Michigan First, and City of Kalamazoo to identify historically underrepresented people with businesses in all sectors that could participate in the design, construction, and operation of the event center. In addition, Catalyst will solic solicit those identified businesses to participate in pre-bid education seminars organized by Catalyst to learn how their businesses might be successful partners in the project. In addition to the proposal to the county, Catalyst is prepared to donate $6 million to the Northside Association for Community Development, 
which if NACD chooses to invest in an endowment fund could earn 200,000 or more per year to provide grants to residents, enhance housing, the arts, open spaces, entrepreneurial efforts and such other programming goals as may be identified by NICD. I would like to emphasize that time is of the essence of moving this project forward. Catalyst has several other non-county land parcels necessary for the project under contract, but only for a limited time. Commissioners, I appreciate your time and consideration of our proposal. I would now like to turn over to Jonas Peterson of South Michigan first to get more details about the proposed project and anticipated positive impacts to the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, good evening, Chair Taylor, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, Jonas Peterson, I'm the CEO of Southwest Michigan First, and uh, I wanna say thank you for the, the chance to present this evening. Uh, as you know, the idea of creating an event center in downtown Kalamazoo has been years in the making. Many community leaders, business leaders have stepped up along the way to identify the best possible site, analyze feasibility, study outcomes, and create a common vision together. With your help this evening, we believe now is the time for action. We're absolutely thrilled absolutely thrilled that Catalyst Development is proposing to construct a privately funded, state-of-the-art event center in downtown Kalamazoo. We believe this project will be a game changer, not only for downtown, but for our entire region. And what I'd like to do this evening is share some highlights about overall project feasibility, community benefits, and there are many, and then turn it over to Jordan Green and the team at Tower Pinkster to walk you through our initial concept design for the project. So let's start with feasibility. If we can move forward to the next slide, please. It, this is one of the first questions you may ask, and, and we've sure heard it along the way. Is this project feasible? The answer is a resounding yes. Let me unpack that a little bit. In 2021, Discover Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Downtown Partnership, and Southwest Michigan First, all teamed up. We hired Convention Sports and Leisure International to conduct an in-depth feasibility study of an arena in downtown Kalamazoo. If you're not familiar with CSL, they're the best of the best. They're the gold standard of evaluating projects of this size, type, and scope. The results from that feasibility study were overwhelmingly positive. It showed that not only were our early plans feasible, but they were sustainable for the long run, and that a project like a downtown event center would generate a massive economic impact for all stakeholders. So through that study, we learned a variety of things. We learned there's a high level of unmet demand for local events. We learned that we should actually take a look at building the project even bigger and including flat floor space for larger conventions. That's exactly what we've done. And that's part of the vision we're sharing this evening. So that initial concept design work um, show that, that we're showing, it builds upon multiple iterations of feasibility studies and significant feedback from stakeholders over the course of last year. Let's talk about uh, some of the, the community benefits uh, connected to this project. And, and I wanna say again, that we believe that a privately funded event center, downtown Kalamazoo will be a game changer for our entire region. Here's why. According to CSL, in that feasibility study, the event center, what, once it's fully operational, it will have the capacity to support over 200 events per year. And I believe we're actually one slide before this, if we could go up to two, over 200 events per year supported, $1.5 million of county sales tax, 246,000 of net additional lodging tax to the county, over five, 548,000 of annual attendees are estimated. That supports 36,000 hotel room nights. And this next one's a big one. 
$54 million of economic output per year. That makes this project a key driver of revitalization in downtown and throughout our region. $54 million of annual economic output. It also supports personal income throughout the region, $22 million and nearly 700 positions connected to the project, full-time and part-time. So there are many quantifiable impacts. If we go to the next slide, um, you can see like we can measure a lot of the impacts, but not all of them. There's more, and, and many of them are qualitative impacts. According to CSL, here's the list. Um, according to CSL, the event center that we're proposing has the potential to, to create transformative and iconic effects. What is that, you may ask? Well, it means this is one of the projects that will put our community on the map. It's a project that has the ability to uh, improve the perception of our market to external audiences and visitors. It has the potential to help us attract and retain talent in the market. It has the potential to help us improve our overall population growth because quality of life improves along the way for residents. We've heard from many in survey after survey, especially with the younger generation, that they are looking for more entertainment options. This project delivers. Visitational rides, rise, spin-off developments will likely occur, not just the event center, but around. And we believe this project will be a benefit to students, their internship opportunities, their training opportunities, in hospitality and sports management, and the list goes on. So if we go to the next slide, you can, you can see there's quantitative impacts, there's qualitative impacts, and I'm excited to share, and as you heard from Mike, um, the developer has chosen to go even further in support of diversity through this project. Some of those additional commitments for diversity specifically include a workforce development training and employment program to encourage and assist residents from the north side and other, other neighborhoods with gaining employment in hospitality, entertainment, and sports management. 20% of all the food and beverage concession space in the event center to be occupied by BIPOC vendors, Black, Indigenous, peoples of color. All contractors bidding to work on the construction of the event center required to have policies in place showing a commitment to diversity. The developer working with Northside Association for Community Development, City of Kalamazoo, Southwest Michigan First, um, to, to identify BIPOC businesses in particular that could participate in design, construction, and operation of the event center. And then last, but certainly not least, um, you heard of the commitment for a, an additional $6 million donation to the Northside Association for Community Development. This project will be a game changer. Um, for downtown and, and our entire region. So you can see it's full of community benefits. It's gonna generate a massive economic impact. It will help transform downtown. And through those additional commitments has a commitment to diversity, a commitment to lifting up adjacent neighborhoods, especially the north side. On the next slide, you, you see our downtown location. Um, it's, it's highlighted here. It is the highlighted area between West Nidge and Kalamazoo. And the question you may ask is why downtown? We asked the team at consult, uh, Convention Sports and Leisure this exact question, and they told us it was the perfect location. Through that feasibility study, they said that event centers are much more successful when they're located in close proximity to lodging, retail, and restaurants. That is downtown. That's why we wanna locate at this particular location. We believe it drives impact and it drives a better experience for visitors. And with your approval this evening, we can complete the land assembly necessary to move this project forward. All right, so the feasibility was so positive in 2021 that we wanted to go further. We wanted to create an initial concept design for the event center. So last year, our partners at Discover Kalamazoo, and I want to give them a big shout out. They've been right, you know, right there pushing on this project every step along the way. And our team at Southwest Michigan First, we, we worked together. We hired the team at Tower Pinkster and Rossetti to help us create an initial concept design with significant stakeholder engagement along the way. To guide the overall process, we organized a working group 
that working group, you can see the, uh, the members on the screen here. So it was co-chaired by Jane Ghosh of Discover Kalamazoo. Members included Tim Raymond from Greenleaf Hospitality, Commissioner Ray from Kalamazoo County, Andy Wenzel from Plaza Corp, Kevin Catlin from Kalamazoo County, Dan Bartholomew from Western Michigan University Athletics, Jim Ritzma from the city of Kalamazoo, and Jerry Vanderveen from MW Vanderveen Company. Group held and hosted uh, 15 sessions, stakeholder sessions. Throughout the course of last year, we had over 180 participants along the way. We're excited about that concept design and to show and share more, I'd like to turn it over to Bjorn Green with Power Pinkster. Uh, good evening, uh, County Commissioners. Thanks for having me. I'm Bjorn Green with Tower Pinkster. Again, we're, we're excited to be here. We're part of the design team that has worked on this to date. Um, this, what you see on the slide, I'm going to try to take you through most of the slides. What you see on the slide uh, in front of you is just kind of a high level look at uh, the overall project process. Um, and, you know, last, last summer and fall, we organized and then took about six or seven months to, uh, to go through that concept design study. First, taking what the CSL had and then, and then taking and developing the program, developing the concept design, and then, as Jonas mentioned, getting a lot of stakeholder engagement, community engagement. And we're in the kind of the gray bar in between right now where we're working on land assembly, parking strategy, planning approvals. That's the next step. And then there'll, be, there'll still be a full design and construction phase. The design phase will be uh, you know, a 16th month, ef month effort where we will go through all the, the typical planning processes as you develop it forward. Uh, meet with the city and their planning team uh, and talk through all of the, you know, the criteria that we have and obviously go through the whole permitting process as we move forward. So we're still very early in the process, um, but we have, you know, so a good, a good concept design to show you. You head to the next slide. Uh, so the three ingredients that we were given from the CSL study, uh, which was kind of the starting point where it was the arena or event center itself, an event hall, which is a flat floor space for additional events to be held, and then a parking deck. So those were kind of the three starting points um, that we worked on. And if you keep moving to the next slide, please, you know, an arena holds a lot of different events. It holds uh, sporting events, it holds concerts, it holds community events, uh, just as a variety of different shows and, and uh, opportunities to bring, uh, you know, people to our community uh, and to really bring something vibrant and active to downtown. Uh, next slide. And so one of the charges, as you saw from the slide of the team, was to put together a series of stakeholder groups. So we had uh, five, this, this shows six areas, but five stakeholder groups that we put together. And those were members of the community. We wanted to get community input. We wanted to listen to what do we really want to do to make this a true uh, Kalamazoo event center, not an event center that you'd find in any other city, but one that was rich and deep and, uh, and reflected the, the community uh, experience and the community's expectation of what they wanted to see in the, in the building and in the programs that were there. Uh, so we went through quite a, quite a process and then developed sort of the, the mission and vision for each one of these little groups as we moved it forward. And we identified you know, some precedent examples of what we should look for uh, when we're trying to put this all together. If you go to the next slide, we talked a lot about you know, what are the words that we want to make sure come alive in the, in the design. So this is a, you know, just a word cloud that, that kind of highlights the different areas. Again, energy was very important. Social equity, welcoming to all, vibrant, really connected to Kalamazoo. How do we make this truly uh, unique in our, in our community? Uh, keep going to the next one, please. Uh, and then we also put together uh, some guiding principles. Again, just some, some high level things that we could measure against as we move the design forward. What are we looking for? We're looking for it to be energized. We're looking for it to be authentic. We're looking for it to really be welcoming to all. Uh, we're looking for it to be immersive or engaging um, and then really inclusive programming to make sure that it's it's um, it's got a lot for uh, it's got something for everybody is really what we were hoping for. Next slide. So interesting enough, those three ingredients turned into many more ingredients within the makeup again. It, and when we revisited this with the CSL team, they were like, oh, my gosh, this is great. You've taken what was the baseline idea and you've really expanded it. So we, you know, through the process, through the dialogue with the stakeholders, we added our community space, we added a basketball a practice facility, we added a practice ice sheet, uh, and then obviously um, some, team, some team areas within there really to, to kind of round out a, a full program for this site. Keep going. Um, again, so Jonas talked a little bit about the site, but there was the site initially. Keep clicking. These are just some quick diagrams. Again, we want to make sure we connect to the community. We want to make sure we think about 
the conversion of this one-way streets to two-way streets, and we look at this, you know, the city uh, 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 master plan to make sure that we're we're building into the fabric of the city and thinking forward. There's the assembly of the land that you see in that diagram and how it's all coming together. Um, keep going, and then those were the placement of the area. So the arena is kind of in the center. Uh, arenas, a lot of times, a uh, you know. A, uh, an event kind of inwardly focused space. So we wanted to make sure we surrounded it with spaces that were active, spaces that on the street level, you know, you could see activity of what was happening beyond it. Um, and so then we did a three dimensional analysis and showed how it connects to the community. Uh, keep going. Um, it showed some access points where are you going to enter the building? It's a large building on a number of sites. How do you get access in and through and up and around? Um, oh, skip forward a couple. Uh, and then again, just what does it look like when you think about the creek and it and the roads uh, and bringing some green space uh, to life? Uh, obviously, there'll be some future adjacent developments that we'll have to, you know, make sure that we want to play nice with um, in the area. So how do those all come together? Um, and then we just have a few ideas of what early again early conceptually uh, it looks like. If you go to the next slide, um, so the top slides are, are could be what it looks like. The bottom slides are some pressed ex examples from uh, some other communities of uh, what do we want to capture. We want it, We talked about you know what does this want to look like? It wants to be um, transparent. It wants to have warm materials. It wants to be inviting so that the community wants to go into the space. It wants to have some variety to it so that it doesn't look like a big one big mass, but it's broken down into something that feels pedestrian. Uh, it feels like something you can enter easily. Uh, keep going. Uh, and then, you know, the, the words aren't necessarily going to be uh, on the exterior of the building, but we just wanted to highlight where are the activities. So this is a, a view looking um, southeast from, let's say, the, the um, Kalamazoo and Westnage area. Uh, so you can see that practice ice sheet on the corner and hockey would be well displayed uh, so that you could see what was going on behind, behind the, the, uh, the building with a, a glassy facade of basketballs to your left. Uh, the parking structure is kind of hidden behind with some art and some other ideas about how to skin that building so that it looks nice from the exterior. Keep going. Uh, this is a shot looking, um, you're almost standing in the, the creek, uh, the port, you know, the Arcadia Creek from where the, the West Michigan Cancer Center is looking across the street at the plaza. So you're actually looking northeast now. So this is the main entry to the uh, to the event center. What it could look like again, very conceptual, very early on in the process. Next slide. It's kind of an aerial overview in that same uh, quadrant, stand, uh, sitting almost above the the cancer center, looking down across the 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 entire facility. There's that community space in front of the arena. Um, parking's kind of tucked into the distance, and then that event hall is in between it. You go to the next slide. Um, if we do, uh, you know, build a parking structure on the on the site that's uh, right in front of it. This is an idea of what it could look like, you know, three-dimensionally trying to think about our neighbors too and um, uh, what those buildings look like, make sure that it looks cohesive. Uh, and this is a, looking again from the other side where you have basketball and hockey, just kind of a full view of it. And then I think there's one more. This is kind of how it would fit into the, uh, you know, to the, the north side neighborhood and the, and the, the west side of the city. Uh, so again, still early in the concept phase, the design will evolve. And, uh, and we'll be uh, hopefully gaining more insight from the community as we move forward. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, we, so we do have a couple of approvals that we're requesting from the commission. Um, before that though, uh, it, with chair approval, we have a, a handful of community leaders that would like to uh, comment and share their, uh, their, share their support for the project. Happy to have them. Good evening, and um, thank you guys for letting me speak. NACD's board meeting is tonight, and there's still the issue with uh, Cobb Street. I, 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 would, I would like to say that um, it's been over 17 years when then um, president of Western Michigan University, Elson Floyd, invited me to a meeting with some developers with consultants talking about the downtown arena. So it's been a long time for me. And even then I asked them, how will it affect the North side neighborhood? And he said, well, Maddie, you gotta be at the table. I have tried to make sure that I attended the meetings that they had and, and to push forward that 
people in our neighborhood, we're saying, don't, we want you to allow us to work and for us to be part of an economic development project that includes us. And in the Imagine Kalamazoo, um, initiative, it talks about the Northside Cultural Business District and how that connects, how people can go across the tracks and know you still can have a beautiful neighborhood and everything. So I would just quickly like to say that I am in awe that um, the Catalyst developers said, hey, we will work with NACD. We will, we believe in you. We believe that, that you will ensure and assist us in helping to reach the people that you have been talking about for years and that other people, commissioners, other leaders, other, other just regular people who came to the meeting. So I am here and, and my board, obviously my board had to agree to this. And we, we love the fact that there's some suggestions, but also we asked that, um, if in fact NACD wanted to do something like pay off the grocery store, would that be part of it? They said, you know what, we're doing unrestricted. We want the people in your neighborhood. We want sustainability. We want employment. We want job training. And we want you all to know that we believe in what you're doing. So I thank you. And I hope that you all will, um, will, will go ahead with the purchase of the properties. And I really have to go because there is all these people in my office. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betty. Good evening. I'm Greg Dobson. I am one of the owners and the chief operating officer for AVB, which is a real estate development construction company in Kalamazoo County, also a Kalamazoo County a resident. And it's my pleasure to speak here in, uh, in regards to this awesome project. Um, my goal is to follow up on Maddie's comments in regards to some of the history in regards to this um, property. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, at one time, these four blocks were occupied mainly by the Cole Gilmore car dealership. And um, in 2001, right after the death of Jim Gilmore, uh, my business partner, Joe Gizmondo, uh, Tom Cole, who is now also deceased in Jim Gilmore's estate, um, donated several of these uh, properties. Uh, and they're on, you, know, this, you can see the yellow pieces. There's obviously been some assemblage done and some changes to the property made since then. But they donated this property with the specific and stated purpose that the property uh, allow an event center to happen for the city of Kalamazoo in Kalamazoo County. And we, um, we're just so excited that Catalyst has taken this on and that Southwest Michigan First has partnered with them. We think it's an amazing opportunity for our community. In fact, uh, have to pinch ourselves to believe that this opportunity is in front of us as a community. We're really excited about it. Finally, um, I would like to say that um, Joe is the visionary of our company and he's done a lot of visionary projects. And when these original parcels were, were donated, the donation came not only with this idea that this be the, the site for an event center, but with an image and, and I can share these around, but this is the image that was developed back in 2001. And if you look at it, there's just an amazing number of similarities uh, 22 years later um, in terms of what is being proposed today. And um, we'd like to thank you um, in advance for your consideration, your support, and uh, thank Catalyst Development Southwest Michigan first as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, Chair Taylor and Vice Chair Ray and City or County Commissioners. Sorry, I had my City Commission meeting last night. So um, I am here tonight in support of the event center. Uh, Jim Ritzmouth, City Manager of Kalamazoo. Uh, it was referenced uh, that this supports the goals of Imagine Kalamazoo, and I just want to reinforce that. Obviously, um, there's several goals that this will hit: shared prosperity. A connected city, uh, but, uh, strength through diversity, economic vitality, and complete neighborhoods. And 
just the recognition that this proposal has for the, the north side is admirable. Uh, the, the DEI components of it are, are just incredible. Um, and, and for downtown, downtown is everyone's neighborhood. And so having a strong downtown is, is good for obviously the city of Kalamazoo, but also the county and the region. So totally supportive of this and, uh, and look forward to being a partner at the table through this uh, process. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Jane Ghosh, President and CEO of Discover Kalamazoo. I am thrilled to be bringing this project, that this project is coming forward uh, at this time. Discover Kalamazoo as the Convention and Visitors Bureau of Kalamazoo County thinks this is exactly the right thing to do in our community and specifically in downtown. There are so many reasons, but I'll stick to the top three. One is the events that will happen in this arena that are currently happening elsewhere in the county. We are not maximizing the economic impact of those events. By bringing them downtown, people will not just drive in, go to the event and leave. With the distributed parking model, they'll stay, they'll shop, they'll discover our amazing restaurants and the downtown culture that we have. That then in turn, reason number two, that helps create a more vibrant community for residents. The more foot traffic and, and traffic in those businesses that we can have, the more entrepreneurial opportunities there'll be for residents to enjoy those businesses as well. And then thirdly, the design of this event center maximizes the opportunity for Discover Kalamazoo to bid on events that we can't bid on right now. So people who have the opportunity to put place an event anywhere in the state, anywhere in the region, anywhere in the country, there are so many that we can't even bid on because we don't have the facilities in, in Kalamazoo to host them. And with this event center, we'll be able to open our opportunities to so many more to bring in visitors and increase the visitor spending in Kalamazoo County and the economic impact that that has. We're strongly in support and very, very thrilled to, uh, to be talking about this tonight. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Tim Raymond. I'm the CEO for Greenleaf Hospitality Group. Had the opportunity to work for the company for 18 years now and i'm thrilled to be here today because the majority of my leadership over the 18 years has been at the radisson and i just know the large impact that this will make it to downtown kalamazoo and so i'm thrilled uh, to be here the second arm of leadership that i have the responsibility for is the kalamazoo k-wings and i can tell you the ex exciting um conversations that are happening around the locker room around the administration and staff uh, and especially with slappy uh to be able to come to downtown kalamazoo is is uh, happening all the time so Although we love the charm of our 50 year old uh, barn that we have over on Sprinkle Road, uh, it does limit us in a lot of things that we could do for um, things that Jane talked about with conferences, uh, concerts, youth athletics, uh, and moving downtown would definitely give us that opportunity. So thank you for the consideration. Good evening. And as always, it's a great night to be a Bronco. Uh, Dan Bartholomew, I'm, I'm the new athletic director at Western Michigan. I've been on the job for just about a year. Uh, and, a, and a large part of that year for me has been engaging uh, with several of you and, and obviously with the design uh, concept working group as it relates to this incredibly exciting project uh, and incredibly exciting opportunity, not only to elevate our own facilities at Western, but also partner with the local community in really unique and exciting ways. So I wanted to share the benefits that, that we see at Western as it relates to our athletic department in this important project. Just this past January, that, that was a year into my tenure, uh, our athletic department released our strategic plan, which is a document that will guide our decision-making over the next five years. Our plan outlines six goals, to lead the country in the holistic development of our student athletes, to win championships and regularly compete at the top of our conferences, to aggressively generate the revenue necessary to support our championship goals, to provide a welcoming and inclusive environment for our students, fans, and staff, to invest in new facilities that lead our conferences and to strategically partner with our local communities. One of the many things we must do to achieve this vision is place a high priority on facilities that will put us at the top of our conferences, help us recruit and win, and provide amenities that have the capacity to generate revenue needed for championship programs. We must also place a high priority on improving the experience our student athletes receive within their facilities. We must place a high priority on the fan experience within our venues so that athletics is a vibrant and central part of the student experience and the community interface with our university. 
And finally, we must place a high priority on community partnership and activation. Our vision for Bronco Athletics comes down to two words, comprehensive excellence. Our athletic facilities, unfortunately, have a long way to go to meet that bar, particularly in hockey and basketball, where I can confidently say that it is a statistical fact that they are the worst in our conferences. In our current state, we do not compare favorably to our peers, which inhibits our student athletes experience and our ability to recruit and compete at the highest level. We need more practice space for men and women's basketball and for hockey. We need state-of-the-art strength, conditioning, developmental, and nutritional space. We also need the amenities that fans expect, our students deserve, and that our community can enjoy. Southwest Michigan First, the Catalyst Development Company and the Design Working Group have put together an exciting vision, and we are fortunate to have Bronco Athletics included in the discussion. They are on a path to creating an innovative partnership that would be a tremendous asset for our community and would align with the vision for Western Athletics that I've outlined today. I believe we are on the right track and look forward to the next steps. It is exciting to have an opportunity to privately fund this important project, and we are appreciative of that generous support. I'm excited about this vision and remain eager to see it advance on this first step of many because it offers great possibilities and a bright future for our students, our athletic department, and our community. Thank you. All right, I believe that covers everybody. Um, so there was a, uh, many that wanted to uh, share their support for really this incredible act of generosity and this incredible opportunity to move our region forward. We do have a, a couple asks that were kind of that closing slide uh, for potential action from the, the county this evening. But happy to answer any questions. Okay, before I open it up to commissioners for questions or comments, I would be remiss if I did not just in full, I cannot understate how important uh, this is to this community. Um, back in 2002, I was a 23 year old county commissioner and I remember these discussions uh, taking place and happening. Um, this, this has been a 20 some year work in progress. And you know what, sometimes when you take 20 years, you get it right at the end. So um, I'm happy to be entertaining this discussion, uh, commissioners. Questions? Commissioner Gissler. Thank you, Chair. I don't go back to 2002 as a county commissioner, but I go back to 2011. Uh, and the idea of a downtown arena has come up twice before this in my tenure. And the two words on the, it's actually on the summary page at the end of the first line, that is enough to turn me around privately funded which means it's not gonna pay, be paid for by the taxpayers in any way. And it's gonna be on the tax rolls. It's gonna pay some taxes when it's so successful, which I now expect it to be. I, you know, I, I, I met you when you were first uh, in town, I think, Jonas, you know, what, two weeks or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and Jane was there, I believe also. And I tried to get them to talk about an arena oh man you know they wanted nothing to do with it and that's because they were <laughs> they were working under under wraps so to speak and i think this is incredible thank you any other commissioner questions or comments uh commissioner ray thank you chair i don't have any questions um i just want to say that um I'm pleased with the project. Um, it was important to me to lift up the, the negative impact that this will have on the community um, and elevate that conversation and discussion. So I will say that I'm also happy with what the developer is committing to for the Northside neighborhood in this agreement. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mazur. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Well, as as a former Bronco, I'm I'm in full support of this too, and also you know, I've been in Kalamazoo my whole life, so I just I think this is really exciting. Look, Commissioner Hepler, then Commissioner Streps. Thank you, Chair. Um, I too am very pleased. I I do go back to the O2 with uh, my former colleague here or my colleague and. Um, and I am very pleased uh, for all the hard work that you folks have all put into this. 
And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the progress that comes from it and the great benefits to Kalamazoo County, Kalamazoo uh, in general. So I'm full of support of getting this moved ahead. Uh, I know we have some work to do and you guys have a lot of work to do because I've been involved in some of that kind of stuff. So thank you. Commissioner Streps. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you to all the community partners here and the, the presentation tonight. It is a very exciting opportunity for this community and transformational, but I do have some questions. I have four. Um, first, I'd like to know the arena. What's the seatage on the arena? We see some examples of uh, high name talent uh, opportunities potentially, but how many seats are we gonna be able to fill and what sort of uh, events will that attract? Yeah, so it's a 6,500 seat arena. That's for mainly for the hockey uh, and basketball. And then there's different configurations for concerts uh, that would take it anywhere from 7,000 to up to 8,000 seats in total once you fill the floor. So, and then again, variety of uh, all different types of events that could occur. Again, that's, you know, the, the today's event centers are built with a lot of flexibility and a lot of technology so that mm -hmm. you can host anything from you know, a local uh, community event all the way up to a national or international event. The next question is Commissioner Gisler uh, elevated the private funding of the opportunity um, and that it would be on the tax roll. So I wanna dig into that a little bit. I see here about community benefits that property taxes are not one of the listed benefits. Talks about sales tax. What is the potential future ownership. It's been a long-term structural issue for the city of Kalamazoo. The number of governmental and nonprofit buildings uh, within the confines of the city has an impact on the tax base. What does that look like for this event center going forward? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So I can speak to part of this and then maybe Mike, you want to jump in as well. Um, so um, we do expect this project to generate property tax revenue. When uh, uh, there's been multiple iterations uh, of the project along the way, um, including a previous iteration that, um, that had it um, held by a, a, a public entity. Um, and so um, we did not have a chance to run the feasibility or the projections for exactly what the property tax income would be in a private model. Um, so that's the only reason why it's not included is one of the projections. We just didn't get around to running that specific calculation, but it, we do expect it to be a benefit. You want to talk about ownership? Sure. As far as the uh, ownership, the proposal is under the name of Catalyst or some affiliated entity. So it's envisioned ultimately it'll be a special purpose entity, you know, set up under the same common ownership um, to be determined. But it again, be the same ownership as Catalyst. Uh, two additional questions. So, um, Thank you to Vice Chair Ray and uh, to this board for allowing space for discussion about equity in dealing with um, not only celebrating all of the positive impacts, but working to deal with some of the negative externalities that could impact uh, the near neighborhood. So in the community benefits offer that's been put forward, just a couple questions there. In the workforce development initiatives through Greenleaf Hospitality, can you speak to what extent is involved with that? What is the, the investment in those sort of workforce development opportunities? How many people, you know, would be, uh, you know, targeting to get involved um, more than just we're going to offer job training? I mean, I mean, how do we get people to participate? It, so the hospitality group currently uh, is aligned with some community organizations like Urban Alliance and so forth. And uh, as far as it, how it would network with NACD, I think, you know, it, it, that's to be determined and, uh, you know, we would, you know, want to sit down and kind of put that together. Uh, it's our commitment, our intent to partner with them, bring it in, in to the current uh, organization and, and the things that they're currently doing. And so there'd be resourcing behind that? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. And then my last question is about um, the working um, with NACD Southwest First City to identify BIPOC businesses that could participate in design development and construction. Is it a, a, a commitment that they will 
participate, not just could, but will we will we ensure that we bring in uh, BIPOC perspectives in design, construction, and development? It is part of our agreement uh, with the county is, is one of the community benefit items that specifically listed. Again, that's our intent. I think developers uh, track record and history with other projects that he has uh, done to, is uh, speaks for itself. And I can add uh, just a, a little bit more to that as somebody who's been involved uh, along the way, I think this project is one of those um, unique gifts of generosity for the community. And it has been expressed and it has been um, delivered with an, an intent. And one of our goals is to maximize community benefit along the way. That is driving this entire project. And you can see many of those benefits um, we can articulate. Uh, they can be quantified. Some uh, can't currently be quantified and others at this stage are, are an intent um, that we, um, we intend to flesh out as this project moves forward. And the whole nature of an event center really is to uh, to benefit the, the community. Commissioner Wheeler, did you have no? I guess my question would be for administration or probably more for corporate counsel. Um, how are we, are we there yet with something that we can, <laughs> where are we in the process? Thank you, Chair Taylor. Um, in order to facilitate that, we would need uh, a motion to authorize us to enter into negotiations, um, and I can provide that motion. Um, and in terms of discussions, we've had some preliminary discussion with uh, council, and uh, I've provided some feedback on a draft purchase agreement, as well as options uh, for parking that was a component of that. But uh, we really need a motion before we can really negotiate that agreement. Well, the chair would entertain a motion uh, to um, allow uh, administration and corporate counsel to um, continue negotiations and for the chair to sign once negotiations are reached. Is that appropriate? Might, might I make one suggestion before he moves it? Please do. Um, that it include at a minimum the terms and conditions from the term sheet provided by Catalyst uh, to the board this evening. Okay, I'm going to try to get this right. Um, the chair will entertain a motion that uh, administration and corporate counsel finalize the purchase agreement and the parking options based on the term sheet that Catalyst provided. Did I get it? All right. Motion moved by Commissioner Hepler, supported by Commissioner Mazur. Any discussion? Clerk, would you please take roll? Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Vice Chair Ray. Yes. Commissioner Streps. Yes. yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Commissioner Gisler. Yes. Vice Chair Pro Tem Hepler. Yes. Nine yes. Well, congratulations. Last item on the Committee of the Whole, um, MAC conferences. Um, I think uh, Commissioner uh, Kevin uh, has given everybody, um, is there just kind of a show of hands? Before I even, I, I would really encourage uh, Commissioner Delu, Commissioner Mazur, and Commissioner Wheeler to attend this one in Lansing. I have always found personally the um, legislative one is by far the most informative as far as policy is concerned. So just FYI, if you can make it, um, as to, uh, Commissioner DeLu, this is the real uh, commissioner school. <laughs> but if you can make it, just uh, contact uh, administrator or um, let them know that you'd like to attend. And um, I believe we have a motion to go into closed session. Chair, Chair yes. that, that closed session is actually on the regular meeting. Then never mind. Then can we adjourn and go get something to eat for about 30 minutes? All right. We are adjourned.
All right, I am going to very, very slowly call the uh, March 21st, 2023 regular Board of Commissioners uh, to order. Um, who was giving the invocation reflection today? Looks like it's me. All right, um, can we please stand? Dear Lord, we ask that you look over us tonight in our deliberations for the thoughtful participation of Kalamazoo County residents, and we act in their benefit. We ask that you give us the wisdom and guidance to make the right decisions so that all people in our county can prosper. We ask this in your name. Amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Proclamations and communications. Uh, Commissioner Gissler, do you have that handy? Just the just the headlines of the proclamations. Yeah. I'd appreciate you. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm not going to read the numbers. Uh, if you need the numbers, you know, that's too bad. <clears throat> Tuscola County resolution honoring the Michigan Association of Counties, a similar resolution from Leelanau County, uh, another one from Schoolcraft County. Now that's Schoolcraft County, which I think is over near Detroit, sort of, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, I know it's not, it's not Schoolcraft in South County here. So <clears throat> uh, a Lake, uh, this is a different resolution, a Lake County resolution dedicating courtroom A to the Honorable Mark S. Wickens, Osceola County resolution honoring the Michigan Association of Counties again, and a letter from gun violence Delta Sigma Theta sorority supporting the effort on gun violence. And the last one uh, among the correspondence is Iron County Resolution affirming support for all constitutional rights, including the right to bear arms and to adequately fund mental health services. That's all that I've got on the proclamations and communications. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gissler. Um, Clerk Cox, would you please take us, give us in a roll? Commissioner DeLue. Here. Commissioner Gissler. Here. Vice Chair Pro Tem Hepler. Here. Commissioner Mazur. Here. Commissioner Morales. Present. Vice Chair Ray will be here. Commissioner Strebs. Here. Chair Taylor. Here. Commissioner Wheeler. Here. Eight present. And Vice Chair uh, Ray did inform me that she would not be here today if something came up, um, but so she, she, she gets an excuse to pass. <laughs> um, this next uh, on them is approval of minutes. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 7th, 2023 meeting, Committee of the Whole and regular meeting minutes. Moved by Commissioner Wheeler, supported by Vice Chair uh, Commissioner Hepler. Discussion? Uh, Clerk, would you please take roll? Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Commissioner Gissler. Yes. Vice Chair Pro Tem Heffler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Commissioner Strebs. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Eight yes. All right. This next takes us into a uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for citizens to address the Board of Commissioners. Uh, please give us your name and address and limit to three minutes. Good evening. My name is Yvonne Jackson. I'm at 238 Falkirk Court, Kalamazoo, 49006. And I am here, Chair Taylor and commissioners and honor guests, um, as the vice, first vice president of the Kalamazoo alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And I have my members, if they can join me. 
Thank you. So Delta Sigma Theta was founded in January 13, 1913 by 22 collegiate women at Howard University to promote academic excellence and provide assistance to those in need. Now, 110 years later, with more than 300,000 initiated members and over 1,000 chapters worldwide, we continue our focus on service, scholarship, sisterhood, and social action. Here in Kalamazoo County, we have 85 members of diverse backgrounds, including lawyers, judges, doctors, chemists, educators, principals, directors of community organizations, and physical therapists, to name a few. Today, we join you publicly and virtually as we focus on Delta Days at our local government. This is in line with Delta Days at the United Nations, which took place last weekend, and Delta Days with the, at the nation's capital, which will take place starting on Friday. We are committed to the growth of our community, celebrating and collaborating with the community organizations and equity for our community. Lastly, this nonpartisan organization will celebrate 50 years here locally in the Kalamazoo community with doing public service in this community on June 20, 23rd, 23rd, 2023, sorry. We hope you will join us. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity and giving us the time to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Dozma, uh, 2436 Woodward Avenue, Kalamazoo. Um, I wanna thank you for listening today uh, and thank our county staff for understanding the importance of taking necessary steps to prepare our community for the multiple crises we are facing. Among them are justice, housing, and climate change. Um, I represent the Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition. We helped secure funding and planning that brought the Climate Co uh, Sustainability Coordinator position to your agenda today. We can all feel the changes occurring in our world. We all feel pressure and grief from the enormity of the burdens before us. I do. I'm also a mother and a grandmother of two one-year-old girls. We can see many coming storms while we, move, while we move through the current ones. There is much work being done and you are doing part of it today. Thank you for your vote to bring a climate and sustainability into our county planning office. This move is an investment in your future and our future, and it will arm us with someone's time dedicated to this community, to what solutions and impacts and planning are needed right here in our place. This is not an end to our work, but it's a beginning. A countywide climate sustainability coordinator in our planning office will bring us into a leadership position in addressing the steep climate and justice related challenges we face. Let's think strategically about preparation for the current and coming environmental shifts and swings and impacts. Let's be ready for what's coming that we may be stronger together as all life endures great changes. We are connected to each other no matter our political leanings and this position is an opportunity to work together across municipalities to set ourselves up for greater stability and survivability in the face of intensifying climate driven impacts. Thank you for being part of that. Risks to our local communities include increased rates of asthma, increased flooding damage to our homes, businesses, roads, and traffic, increased storm damage like the ice storm we recently came, went through together, increased need for energy improvements, increased draw on our electric grid due to increased AC use and transition to electrification, increased damage to homes, businesses, and other county infrastructure like roads, increased challenges to farmers and food systems decrease water quality and decrease health to our ecosystems, among other things. Um, to start with, 31% of people live in poverty in Kalamazoo City, one of our county municipalities, one of the highest rates in the state. And all of the impacts I shared will, imp will have greater impact on our, those vulnerable communities like Black people of color and, and the poor. Michigan is likely to see an increased population growth and demand for development as climate change causes people to migrate away from areas experiencing greater challenges than Michigan, um, looking for preferable places with more water. And we need to be prepared. The county climate sustainability position. 
Hi, my name is Olivia Schenker. And the, count, the county climate sustainability position will take action to build systems to lessen the consequences and increase preparedness through actions like housing, green, housing and green buildings. So insulating and weatheritizing experiencing existing structures, provision of high efficiency electric appliances and HVAC systems, especially for low income residents, raising standards for energy efficiency in buildings of all types and providing analytical tools to builders to find ways to reduce utility loads, providing incentives and assistance for, for distributed renewable energy solutions, establishing a rigorous urban forestry and tree planting program, especially in aging and traditionally, in traditionally neglected residential areas. Uh, transportation and infrastructure identifying vulnerable transportation infrastructure, developing plans to proactively harden, uh, harden vulnerable infrastructure, providing uh, strategically located electric vehicle charging stations, examining and potentially restructuring local public transportation, food systems and sustainable agriculture, working with KV, working with the KVCC Food Innovation Center and the County Extension Service to assist farmers with technical information and financial assistance to adapt to changing grow growing conditions, finding ways to incentivize com community gardens and fresh markets, offering accessible education and home garden gardening and free seedlings, developing a community composting program, habitats and biodiversity, modifying audiences and encouraging yards with native plants, providing education and seedlings for pollinator gardens, water, water quality, accessibility, and environmental concerns, planning development to minimize risk due to increased flooding, implementing a regular septic evaluation system to ensure compliance with state regulations. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work securing that funding. Are there any other citizens wishing to address the board? Kevin, can you let me know if there's anybody with a pre recorded message? Yes, we have one pre recorded message this evening, and uh, Dina will play that in just a moment. Please play this message at both the 4 p.m. and the 7 p.m. meetings of the Kalamazoo County Board of Commissioners on March 21. During the public comment section of the 4 p.m. meeting on March 7, Adrian Zaya from the YWCA asked the Board of Commissioners for $90,000 to support the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund. Daniel Hamilton, also from the YWCA, spoke in favor of the request at both the 4 p.m. and the 7 p.m. meetings on March 7. I'm calling today to strongly oppose such funding. The YWCA Reproductive Health Fund provides financial support for a variety of reproductive and counter-reproductive services. At the top of their list is increasing access to abortion. In 2021, they received funding from three sources, including $43,900 from Kalamazoo County. That money had originally been earmarked for Southwest Michigan First, but was rescinded from them and given instead to the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund. That measure passed by a single vote. In order to gain the deciding vote, proponents promised to draft a contract stipulating that Kalamazoo County taxpayer money would not be used for abortions. Although well-intentioned, that contract ended up being merely cosmetic. Using the county money to pay for non-abortion expenses freed up money from the other two sources that could then be used for abortions. Now the YWCA is asking the county for more than twice as much money for their reproductive health fund. During 2021, the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund received major funding from the National Institute for Reproductive Health and from the Collaborative for Gender and Reproductive Equity. In 2022, they received money from New York City philanthropist and multimillionaire Agnes Gund. They clearly have funding sources other than Kal Kalamazoo County into which they can tap. 
please do not use Kalamazoo County taxpayer money to fund the YWCA Reproductive Health Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any people online? Dina, may you advise on any hands that are raised, please? Yes, we do have one hand raised and I'll bring that person over. Hello, my name is Ronald Huster. Uh, I live at 1314 Coolidge Avenue, Kalamazoo. Um, I heard that the uh, Road Commission was uh, going to turn in a letter to the commissioners signed by representatives from all the townships of the county. thought that was really interesting because the Road Commission is a monopoly. Uh, the, the townships have no other choice than to deal with the Road Commission. So why would they ever say anything bad about them? That would be something really foolish to do. Um, I think uh, the uh, county commissioners need to worry more about what the, the voters, what the residents of the county want for their uh, to happen with the road commission, which is really out of control. Uh, this is just another sign of it. They go around to the townships and have them sign this letter saying that uh, they don't want the they don't want this board to oversee them. They really need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's there are no other hands raised in the queue. Thank you. Um, and that takes us into closed session. Is there a motion on the floor? Commissioner Wheeler. I move that the board go into closed session as permitted by MCL 15.2681E to consult with the board's attorney regarding trial or settlement strategy in connection with specific pending litigation as an open meeting would have a detrimental financial effect on the litigating or settlement position of the board. Motion on the floor, supported by uh, Commissioner Hepler. Discussion? All those in favor? Oh, nope, they gotta take a roll call, don't we? Commissioner Gissler. Yes. Vice Chair Hepler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Eight yes. All right, we're in closed session. Okay.
Mr. So is I'm so confused with our our bylaw changes, but is this the uh, place where I can ask for a couple items to go to non consent? Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, I would like to move item 2023-5737 from planning. Um, so I'd like to have discussion around the climate coordinator and then item 2023-5827 related to the treasurer's office. I like that move to non-consent. Chair, Chair, thank you. Um, and then also, if the commissioners would not mind, the uh, DEI uh, committee bylaws actually need to be uh, amended by the DEI committee before the board can approve them tonight. So if we may have that removed, uh, they're, they, they did. Yeah, they had a quorum and recommended them, but there were some additional items that need to be amended. Very minor, but nonetheless, uh, they should be able to come back on the fourth. Uh, they have a special meeting tomorrow. So move removal of the DEI bylaws. I, I don't think, yeah, I think you do have to. Okay, I'm sorry. Or no, just to ask. All right, Board of Commissioners, uh, 2023 5792, request for review and approval of Young Professionals 2023 Initiative, Michigan Works. Uh, 2023 5804, request for approval to authorize the county clerk and board chair to sign annual 911 surcharge collection letter. Uh, 2023 5807, request for approval to adopt Juneteenth as a county government holiday for employees at the recommendation of the DEI Community Advisory Committee. 2023-5810, request for approval of ARPA grant agreement amendment between Kalamazoo County and uh, Kalamazoo County Government and COPE Network. 2023-5803, request for approval to appoint Randy Thompson to the Central County Transportation Authority. 2023-5815, request for approval to reappoint Maddie Day to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Board. 2023-5816, request for approval to appoint Ramona Lumpkin to the Integrated Services of Kalamazoo County, ISK. 2023-5817, request for approval to appoint David Combs to the South Central Michigan Planning Council. 2023-5789, proposed amendments to board bylaws and rules of procedure. Buildings and grounds, 2023-5494, a request for approval of sole source vendor with KSS Enterprises. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, 2023. Oh, oh I wasn't here for that, sorry, we'll skip that. Drain commissioner, 2023-5608, Request for approval of a contract with Faye Schultz, uh, Berzechke, Rhodes, PLC. Uh, finance, 2023-5841, request for approval of various budget adjustments and transfers. Uh, health and community services, 2023-5723, request for approval of one MDHHS Emerging Threat Physical Year 2023 Amendment number one and two, health officer to elect electronically sign amendment on county's behalf with EGRAMS. 2023-5504, request for approval of MDHHS emerging threat uh, FY23, amendment number two, and two, health officer to electronically sign amendment on county's behalf with EGRAMS. 2023-5734, Request one, acceptance of amendment number one to Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, comprehensive agreement uh, number 
and two, for a health officer to electronically sign the amendment on the county's behalf in eGrams. 2023-5669, request for acceptance to amendment number two to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services comprehensive agreement, and two, for the health officer slash director to electronically sign the amendment on the county's behalf in eGrams. 2023-5755, request for acceptance of statement of grant award number 2023-3 to the Area Agency on Aging. 2023-5766, request for approval and signature of contract with Advanced Health Pharmacy. 2023-5768, request for approval and signature of contract with the City of Portage slash Portage Zhang Senior Center. 2023-5769, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with MRC Industries Incorporated. 2023-5770, request for approval and signature of entering into a contract with Deaf Inc, DBA, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services. 2023-5771, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with Senior Services Incorporated, DBA Milestone Senior Services. 2023-5772, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with Senior Services Incorporated, DBA Milestone Senior Services. 2023-5776, um, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, I apologize, uh, Emucule Senior Center. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, 2023-5777, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with Advanced Health Pharmacy. 2023-5779, request for approval and signature of entering into contract with Lending Hands of Michigan Incorporated. 2023-5830, request for approval and signature of Health Department's Plan of Organization for the State Accreditation Process. Information Technology, 2023-5647, Request for approval and signature of Cisco Security Enterprise Agreement. Parks and Expo 2023-5757. Request for approval and signature of 2023 Expo Center Facility Rental Contract with the National Street Rod Association. 2023-5758. Request for approval and signature of a 2024 Expo Center Facility Rental Contract with the National Street Rod Association. 2023-5759, request for approval and signature of a 2025 Expo Center facility rental contract with the National Street Rod Association. Planning, 2023-5737, request for one, approval and signature of memorandum of understanding with the Kalamazoo Climate that one, that one got pulled? Okay, sorry, scratch that one. Um, the next one is under the Sheriff's Office. 2023-5829 approval, uh, request for approval to accept the MMRMA ramp, RAP grant award. Uh, under the treasurer, 2023-5762, request for approval to accept up to a $50,000 grant from the city of Kalamazoo to assist delinquent taxpayers in the city of Kalamazoo. And lastly, 2023-5827, request for approval of engagement letter with Maynard. Uh, that, that one got, okay, sorry, yeah. that one got taken off, so that's it. <laughs> and I will move to approve the consent agenda as, as amended, as presented, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Gisler. Yes. Vice Chair Pro Tem Hepler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Commissioner Strebs. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Eight yes. All right. That, um, well, I think we missed. Uh, Commissioner Hepler, would you make a motion for claims? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would be happy to because everybody wants their paycheck. So uh, <laughs> uh, I make a motion uh, to approve the payroll and disbursements uh, that be 23 5831. 
Second. With a motion and support. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. And that takes us into some of the ones that we took off. What's the first one here? Um, actually, do you want to take the, uh, the Commissioner Strabs, the um, Health and Community Service Planning? Oh, it was on planning. That's why I couldn't find it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move item 2023-5737. Request for of approval and signature of the Memorandum of Understanding, the Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition, and approval of position creation. Motion and support. Discussion. Commissioner Streps. Thank you, Chair. So I just want to thank our community partners who came tonight to speak to Planning Director Grover as well. Wonderful to see all of our partners and collaborators. This is an opportunity for the county to continue to provide leadership and be a facilitator to create collaboration across the county so that we can meaningfully address the effects and mitigation of the climate crisis. So I'm proud to be part of this work with all of you. I thank our commissioners um, for endeavoring in this. Uh, I got a four-year-old and let's give her a world she can live in in 20 years. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hepler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to make clear, this is a grant funded position, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think that's good. So um, I just want to make that clear. And I appreciate you sending over the information that you sent over so I could review it in depth. Um, yeah, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? The motion carries. Okay, now we move into the treasurer. Um, Commissioner Strebs, you want to make that motion? Thank you, Chair. I move item 2023-5762. Request for approval to accept, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. The 5827. Request for approval of engagement letter with Maynard Kasterian, PC, for governmental accounting services. There's support. This support by Commissioner DeLue. Um, any discussion? Commissioner Strebs. Thank you. So I just, uh, for transparency for uh, the public, so the this request for approval and administration, if you could clarify, we've engaged uh, in this additional um, contract for accounting services. Um, because Maynard has been engaged with the treasurer's office in attempt for preparation of our annual audit. That work has not yet been able to be completed. And so there's an additional need to hire more support to ensure that the county's business needed in the treasurer's office is completed. Is that correct? Hi, yes. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Strebs, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. So, uh, yes, so we have put forth this item uh, in preparation of the county's 2022 audit. And there are just a number of items uh, that may uh, require Mainers attention and or assistance. Uh, they have completed their project on the bank reconciliations. Um, they're still tying up uh, January because the auditors need to have uh, all the way through December 2022. And then they also ask for January 2023. Uh, and the same kind of goes for the investments. Uh, but there's a number of other items that still need to be completed. The treasurer's office is working on those. Um, and we are, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just going through the process with them. So this is more of a, uh, of, of, of an item to ensure that we have some redundancy built in and some, some help built in in case they do need it. Um, um, and, and, and that's why we're proposing the support because Maynard has already been helping and assisting that office. We may not have to utilize all of the funds that are uh, requested to be allocated and anything that's not allocated would just go back in the fund balance. And to add on that, you mentioned it at the end um this is also kind of an insurance because we've reached our maximum level that we can do without board of approval so if there was an emergency situation kevin can't react without us giving him that authority to do so 
Any other discussions? All right, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? The motion carries. Okay, that will move us into reports of officers, committees, bodies, administrative controller. This is the last time we do it on this time because we approved our bylaws. So I'm going to I'm going to pass and I'm going to speak in members' time like I'm not supposed to. So Vice Chair, uh, Vice Chair Pro Tem. I will do the same. Okay. And administrator, you don't get that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, Vice Chairs uh, and Commissioners. So I just have a, a couple items to highlight. Uh, I was speaking to board leadership, and I think uh, historically in the past, we have uh, hosted a legislative breakfast where we invite our uh, state legislators and obviously the commissioners into a, a setting uh, so that we can uh, receive uh, legislative updates at the state level. And so we're trying to plan something uh, probably in late April or mid-May. Uh, so we're trying to tie down a uh, location for that. We're looking at uh, possibly partnering with the ARCA Center uh, at K College uh, to host that. Um, I just need to get in contact with the executive director over there and I just received her information today. So we'll keep you updated uh, through board leadership on when that'll be planned and uh, hopefully have some uh, exciting legislative updates to share. So uh, that'll be planned. Um, we have received, uh, as, as far as the topic uh, related to the Justice Center, we did receive uh, initial uh, design estimates to accommodate the new judge. Uh, they looked at two locations. I believe I pointed this out before. The primary look, or, well, one choice being at uh, housing the new judge in the new Justice Center, uh, that uh, estimate was around $4.3 million to renovate the Justice Center post-construction. Uh, the other option was to renovate uh, the uh, Gold Road Justice Complex. And so that's the newer facility attached to juvenile home. Uh, that uh, renovation is around $1.4 million. And uh, although those seem high, what I've asked uh, our owner's rep to do is go back with Tower Pinkster and actually uh, do more design work to see if that number uh, can be kind of pared down a little bit. So uh, they're still working on that, but it looks like uh, the option would likely be to put them in the uh, the Gold Road Justice Complex. I mean, the, they're just so drastic, uh, significantly apart. So, um, and uh, that that decision did uh, encompass uh, the circuit court. So, that, so, so they had um, uh, involvement in coming up with that uh, location to house the new judge. So they're they're fine with it being there. So we're going to come up with the better cost for that. Ideally, what would happen is, is that we would utilize, uh, I would call it fund balance or contingency left over from the project, from the Justice Center project to pay for that renovation uh, so that it's done by 2025. Uh, and I don't know how long it would take them to do that yet. They're just in the preliminary stages of that, but that's ideally where we would have that remaining balance left out of the Justice Center construction to pay for that. Um, I can take a, it looks like uh, Commissioner Morales has a question for me. Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. So I guess my question is with that, um, the juvenile home, that's basically, is that just for family court or juvenile court? And that, that, That's a great question, Commissioner Morales. I, I'm not totally sure, but I know it's a circuit court operation. So okay. um, I guess my yeah. only concern, you know, some people, we already have two courts that people get confused on going to. And if this justice facility is to mimic what we have, you know, a couple streets over, um, how are we going to make sure that our constituents who are used to going to this one place for traffic, civil or whatever, are getting out to the Gold Road complex? Yeah, great question, Commissioner Morales. So I, I, I can uh, gather more details from uh, the courts actually tomorrow. I have a meeting with them, uh, specifically circuit and district. And so this would be circuit court, but uh, I, I would imagine that their plan would be is to uh, communicate with the public what, what, what actual function, because I believe they're still kind of going through, right, and they're trying to determine what function this new judge would have. So they would uh, have all of those kind of sort of cases over at, the, over at that facility, then the Gull Road Justice uh, Complex. Go ahead. And just if we could provide a recommendation that um, how they have the, the electronic boards to let you know where you need to go. If someone 
first year had to go to the Gold Road Complex and they came down here that they had a separate board to say, hey, you're supposed to be here. Absolutely, no, no, uh, noted and, and I'll communicate that tomorrow, absolutely. And that was Commissioner Monte uh, Morales kind of hit uh, really close to what I was gonna get at as well. Um, if we're going to have the two separate courthouses, maybe it doesn't have to be the new judge or whatever is newly created, but something that's completely different type of court, whether it's a specialty court or whether it's a you know, um, referee or something, so that the public would be less confused. They know if they're going for um, you know, adoption cases or something that's in a different court, but everything criminal is in there or everything. And so we're not breaking apart. Like, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. I think she, she, there's a good point there. We got to make sure to our constituents that if we are going to separate the courts, it's a distinctive separate court than the rest of them. Absolutely. Thank you for those comments. Uh, just a, a few more items to share. So the Animal Services and Enforcement Department uh, recently ended their yearly renewal period, which went from uh, December 1st, 2022 through uh, March 1st uh, this year for dog licensing. Uh, direct, uh, Director Chad Ensign reports uh, for the time period uh, be, uh, from January 1st this year through uh, March 10th. Uh, there were 15,416 licenses sold, which uh, totals uh, $274,716.50. Uh, looking at the same time period this year, this is about a 5% increase in uh, revenue. So licenses are still uh, uh, are still available for purchase online uh, by mail or in person. So we just wanted to report that out. Um, wanted to report out, so March uh, 16th was Freedom of uh, Information Day, so those are the FOIA requests that we, uh, that, that we receive. Um, our uh, PIO, Taylor, put out online that last year the county uh, processed 3,401 uh, FOIA requests. Um, so far this year, we've already received 521 FOIA uh, requests in just over two months. Uh, and I just want to recognize uh, all of our FOIA coordinators in uh, county government, uh, one of them uh, being the primary, uh, uh, Carol Babcock in our office, uh, but there's others uh, in the uh, prosecutor's office, the sheriff's office, and so on and so forth. Uh, they all do a great job, and it's a lot of attention to detail. Uh, uh, so I want to thank them for that. Uh, I received some news from uh, the village of Vicksburg uh, last night during their uh, village uh, meeting. Uh, they approved a bid and contract to construct a new village hall in the amount of $2.7 million. Uh, very important to note, and that's why I'm highlighting it tonight, uh, that they saved uh, cash over a, a period of seven years. So it's all just, it's all mm -hmm. being paid for with cash that they saved. Uh, so it just shows that they're very good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Uh, they plan to do a groundbreaking uh, sometime between April 17th and May 1st. So when that's uh, set up, we'll, we'll get that sent out. Uh, so they hope to have that date secured in the near future. And then lastly, uh, as we spoke about sort of the financial issues in terms of uh, issues that we've had um, uh, in, in the treasurer's office, uh, administration and finance have been working on a financial services request for proposals. Um, while county finance is mostly centra centralized in county government here in Kalamazoo County, we do have some offices that do regulate their own finances, such as the sheriff's office, the airport, and circuit court. So we believe that uh, in the event uh, that um, just to create redundancies, create consistency, someone that's uh, that if in, in, in the event something like this happens in the future, we have someone uh, that can be uh, engaged uh, basically immediately have them on uh, have them on some sort of a contract basis. So they've been working on an RFP and, and we can uh, re-engage the board on that when we receive proposals and make a recommendation on who we think uh, would be best fit for that, that sort of uh, uh, contract. So uh, happy to take any questions on any of the items that I shared tonight or any others that you may have this evening. Commissioner Gessler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's not really a question, Kevin. It's a comment. You mentioned that Vicksburg's building their new uh, village hall, and I don't think much of the village is in my turf anymore, but they also wound up uh, three, four years ago before COVID, they actually cut taxes in the village and they still managed to salt it away enough that they could build a new city hall or a, a village hall. So, you know, I, I wanna pay them a, my last kudo as I depart and go to Comstock. Thank you. 
I was going to say, I don't think most of that village is in your district anymore, just a little tiny sliver. Yeah. Okay, any other uh, commissioner comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to um, new business. We don't have any unfinished business in general orders. New business, uh, public hearing for 52, uh, 20, or 5242 Gull Road. Um, Commissioner Gissler, will you take us into a public hearing? I think it's uh, 13 under new business. I got the, uh, you can do it, Commissioner Heffler. No problem. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, under 23-56-53, um, I move to have a public hearing for 5242 Gull Road, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Brownfield Plan, k -Risa Credit Union. Cal C, sorry. Uh, motion and supported by Commissioner Mazur. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? We are now in a public hearing for Kelsey Credit Union. All right, good evening. I'm Matt Lehman, CEO of Kelsey Credit Union. Corporate address is 5220 Lovers Lane, Suite 200 in Portage. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kelsey Credit Union, we were founded in 1954 in the basement of what was National Waterlift, which is today Parker Hannifin. And we have uh, been grounded and grown in Kalamazoo the entire time. Uh, we have five out of our six current branch offices in Kalamazoo County. And we have been working the last two and a half years with three new branch builds in Kalamazoo County alone, one in Vicksburg, one at Portage and Cork, and the one we're here for tonight, which is 5242 Gull Road, which used to be, if you're aware of, an old gas station sitting next to Tin Tin Restaurant out in front of Menards. Um, there was a lot of work we needed to do to, um, uh, well, shall we say, work on the contamination, remove the gas underground tanks, and all the stuff that would go with cleaning up the site. We did get a $360,000 grant from Eagle to help with that, which was very beneficial. But there's still work that we did that didn't get covered in that grant. Overall, Calci invested uh, about $3 million to put a new branch there. Hopefully, if any of you have drove by it or out in that area, um, it looks a whole lot better than what it did being an abandoned gas station. We also added two new positions as a result of opening that branch and being open a little bit more hours than where we were before. Um, we're seeking reimbursement through the Brownfield plan for eligible costs above and beyond what I said, like I said before, that isn't covered by the Eagle Grant. Uh, that is pretty much a quick summary. I thank you for your consideration of this request. I can tell you from my seat, without programs like this, without um, the Eagle Grant, this would have been cost prohibitive for us to redevelop this site. So um, and we put up a brand new branch. We're looking forward to continuing our investment in Kalamazoo County. And I'd be happy to answer questions you have regarding Cal C. Um, if you have any questions regarding the technical brownfield plan. I do have Teresa Searles here from Fishbeck and Macy that you're all aware of to help with any questions that you have. Um, thank you for your time and appreciate everything and all the help that I've been get, we've been getting to put this branch together. Thanks. Questions from commissioners? I will just say this is just another example of the great work that the Brownfield has been doing. Um, I'm just incredibly impressed. The more I look into how they were able to come up with such a long-term funding strategy and plan, they're, they're really going to be a, a power player when it comes to economic development in Kalamazoo County. So kudos to them and congratulations. <laughs> hey, do we have a motion to move out of the public hearing? motion to move out of a public hearing and it's supported all those in favor say aye, aye. those opposed 
The motion carries. Okay, and that puts us into now. It, it's like who who wants it? <laughs> I'm just looking. I'm calling it. There's only nine. <laughs> Commissioner Gessler, can you read? Uh, you you got out of the last one. Jeff helped you out, so. <laughs> and it's supported by Commissioner Morales. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Gessler. Yeah, I happened to go by there in the last week or two. I wasn't able to go to your grand opening. I must have been out of town or something, but uh, it, it's quite a swap to get that for an old closed gas station. And I think they've even got connection to the 1010 parking lot, don't you? Or do I have to go into the Menards lot first? Eh, well, it's still kind of nice and handy. I'm a big fan of 1010. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. So it's exciting for me. Kelsey Credit Union was my first credit union as a 13 or 14 year old um, that my parents made sure each of my brother and sister, we had access to have our own bank account. So I'm um, formerly from the east side. So I'm happy to see some good development going on as we move up Go Road, which kind of looked like a ghost town for some years, but to see a, a bank with such credibility, or excuse me, a credit union with such credibility go to, you know, a population of folks that may not have access or have to come all the way downtown. Cause I think PNC was over there and Kellogg is, I don't know, I know they're the competition, but I don't know if they're still there, but Kelsey is just homegrown and I'm happy to see it on that side. So thanks to, to Brownfield and all the other investors for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, does this, can I do a voice vote clerk? No, nope. you, uh, we could call roll please. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Commissioner Gisler. Yes. Vice Chair Hepler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Eight yes. All right. Uh, Commissioner Morales, do you want to take us into ZZ or the declaring April Public Health Week? Sorry. <clears throat> no, just I'll get you on the. I think Commissioner Deleu's got it. I'll get you on the next one, Commissioner Deleu. Hey, twenty twenty three fifty seven ninety request for approval of the resolution declaring April third through April 9th as Public Health Week in Kalamazoo County. It's been moved by Commissioner DeLue and supported by Commissioner Wheeler. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. That takes us into AAA. I don't have the numbers, I just have the letters. Uh, can you? Uh, Commissioner Strebs, do you want to read um, the creation, the buildings and grounds creation? Or... Quick assist. Thank you, Commissioner Wheeler. So uh, item 2023 request for approval of creation of positions within the buildings and grounds department. Okay, there is a motion and support. Um, Discussion. I will say I've got a couple questions on on this one. Um, one of them, when I go to my civic clerk here and look under funding source, well, there's a couple questions. But one, the funding source, um, it says, where is it? Um, request to be funded with convention facility tax revenue. What what it, what fund is that? Hi, thanks, Chair. That's actually. Uh, 
it's the same. It, it's it's actually the alcohol tax. So that, that oh. yeah, those Senate bills, it's one and the same. It's it's alcohol and convention. Okay. Tax. Yeah. So that that that's kind of the revenue source that we identified today. But through okay. the budget process, we would bake it in in some regard. Uh, but that was the that was the revenue source we identified today. And then my second question, we have four custodial positions and one um, uh, supervisor position for a total of 235, 198. If they're not starting until like the th three months left in the year, why are we budgeting the full year salary for 2023? Wouldn't that be a 2024 process? It would. And so I think really for transparency, we wanted to provide the, the total number to the board, uh, recognizing that, yes, it would be kind of prorated for the for the, uh, the balance of the year. Um, yeah, so so we wanted to include it for transparency, but knowing that uh, this would be budget, it would be part of the budget process for 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I would like uh, Deputy Administrator uh, Cole and Director McNamara likely to come up and they can kind of talk about uh, the implications that the new Justice Center has as mm -hmm. it comes online compared to Crosstown and, and, and Mac, if that's if that's appropriate. Yeah, I, I think that would be, especially as we get to the utility portion of the, the next motion. But I guess one of my fears is um, that we budget the full two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, one hundred ninety out, out of alcohol tax, and then when we look uh, to to budget something else, we say, "Oh, th that that full money, two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, is earmarked for these two positions." We only plan on using about forty thousand dollars of those positions, and so we're going to have one hundred ninety thousand dollars go into carryover. Then it gets back into the sort of the process of how we get to have so much carryover, um, and uh, I just just being aware that if we're going to budget this type of money, we need to know that it's not going to take this amount of money. So why would we budget for the 2023 process? I do understand that, you know, transparency and it will be a part of the 2024 total cost, but it just seems to be a way to earmark more than, but. Absolutely, yeah. So we can certainly, uh, have uh, Director McNamara and uh, Deputy Minister Cole explain kind of what uh, the dollar amount we would need for the for the balance of the year, so that that way it's not confusing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, Commissioner Gissler. Thank you, Chair. I just want to tell you guys I like your hairlines. <laughs> This, this this is another one of those Burger King comments. <laughs> uh, thank you, board. I think um, the conversation, uh, at least the, the context of it, we kind of want to blend, you know, the operation as well as, um, as you know, uh, when this building goes online, it's important to have the context of the phasing. Um, you know, they're substantially complete, but then the utility bills begin to, to begin, and then the transition, we still have to service uh, the building. So, you know, part of the overall concept is to have an aspect of the budget in place um, as a, a bridge. But the intent is, as that transition occurs, is that um, the bills then, as it comes to the county, would then have to go through the administrator. The intent is to have the administrator be able to approve those bills and then pay it. So there may be some shared expense between the project costs and then the operational costs. So this is a, in a sense, an overall bridge that kind of protects that. Um, to get into the detail of what that transition could and should look like and the levels when you guys have those questions, um, Eric will be able to. Yeah, so that. when we did the numbers or, or started to build this, we, we built it for what do we need for a full year? Cause we, we kind of have to look at that. We'll be signing and gaining contracts that are uh, prorated for the when they start and stop so they will be a six month period at some point in this time period too we'll be taking on the new building and we'll still be operating in the old building so we'll have two buildings to operate at that time before they move out and we can finish uh, the handoffs of those other facilities right so um so that's what we presented with the caveat of the, the controller being able to manage the piece of the actual cost, but we wanted to put forward, this is what the whole cost is going to be so that in 2024, we didn't come and ask you again for more money. And we also were able to start to build those contracts out. Some of them like an elevator contract will be a five-year contract. 
you know, um, things like that. So. Any other commissioner questions? We also, um, just as another uh, um, for it, at some point we'll need. All right, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I had no other comments from commissioners. I, I, I will just say, um, you know, I, I would like as much of this funding as possible, especially the transform transformation um, process where you've got, um, you know, you're operating two different buildings uh, as much as possible coming from that 92 million from that, that justice facility dollars. Um, I think we need to, yeah, before we start getting into operational costs, we need to explore that avenue as, again, as I say, as much as possible. And that's, you know, it's a purview of this board um, uh, of, you know, for instance, those floor scrubbers, I think some of them came from the cost from the, uh, the construction of the building. And I think one of them for internally came from here, if I'm recalling correctly, or did they all come from the cost of the building? Yeah, that's all costs of- yeah. Oh, they all did. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, I, yeah, that's, that's, I, I'd like to see as much of it come from there as possible. Now I was identifying that addition in uh, alcohol tax, that, that new thing that we did um, to try to use for internal purposes um, within the county. Now this is qualifies under internal purposes, although it hasn't been in a board purview from that, you know, visionary 30,000 or 50,000 foot level from this board, but I, you know, have no problem with per se um, doing it. I just think that we need to be, all of us as a group, be well aware of what is you know, transpiring as far, as far as the alcohol tax money being utilized for this. Um, I just so commissioners are aware that when we do open up the budget process, that will be a reduction in the potential dollars that we would be able to realize. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and support. Any other discussion? Clerk, would you take roll, please? Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Commissioner Gisler. Yes. Vice Chair Hepler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Eight yes. All right, motion carries. That takes us into the last one. I can find it. Commissioner Hepler, do you got it? You seem to be on this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 23 or 2023 5593 request for approval of new funding request for the downtown justice facility operations and utility costs. Is there support? There is a motion and support. Any discussion? Well, I will be the next one to ask questions on this one as well. Um, this um, uh, cost on the DJF uh, costs and operations, it says in the uh, consent, uh, uh, the board request form that it's for utility costs. But then if you go look on the line item, I don't see any consumer's energy or any sort of vendor that provides utilities. It's, it's like, for custodial supplies, jail locks, and then there's even custodian quantity seven. Is that different than the one that we just uh, approved or is that what's coming over from, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding this, this form. Yes, Chair. Uh, commissioners, I, I will have Deputy Administrator Cole and uh, Director McNamara come up again. This, this should be a little easier, but. So the position, we need seven custodians at the new building, but we're gonna bring over three, two from Mac and one from Crosstown. So those positions eventually move over into the new building when the other building closes. We'll have some trouble in that time, but they won't move over, they'll move over when staff moves over. So um, we'll have the other four online to be able to, learn the building, clean it, do that kind of stuff. And then the other three will have to come in and learn their areas. So that's the idea of the transition. So that's why we're asking for four. And, but it shows that we need seven 
And what you saw was we put our 100% cost together. And then below that, the cost that we thought that we we're going to bring over from that you already have funded at the MAC and the Crosstown. So we need those funds too. So, so then the asks are based off of that and consumers is the utilities is water, gas, and uh, electric. So consumers for two and one is the city water. So but those, in the cost sheet, utilities. I don't see water or consumers. Yeah, they're not listed in that breakout. Those are just put together and that's based on a square footage budget number of what we currently pay. Is there, I guess this is sort of a question you probably won't be able to answer tonight, but is there an anticipation of an increase or decrease from the two different facilities that we had now and utilities moving into that newer building? An increase. An increase. Yeah. And the reason why is it's a bigger square footage that you're building. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's more efficient. Um, but you'll, that's, that's the utility inf that you're seeing. You also have more stuff in there, right? You're operating three cooling towers instead of one. You're, you have mm -hmm. more boilers in there. Um, there's no maintenance that you're paying at Crossstrom right now. Now you're adding maintenance into that square footage. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a bigger building. It's got more stuff. It's more technical. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to use more electricity. But it's going to be really efficient for the size of the building that it is. It's extremely efficient for the size of the building that is and a courthouse. And I noticed you didn't bring over rent. You mentioned uh, court, uh, Matt Courthouse. Wouldn't rent be an offsetting cost as well? You'll lose some of that costing, but from a buildings and ground standpoint, we don't look at the rent because oh. the courts pay the rent uh, at yeah. Crosstown. Yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm thinking of is from a budgetary fiduciary, you know, kind of putting on my hat mm -hmm. as a as a commissioner um, sure. when I'm looking to try to how to how to fund these things. When you have a you know a reduction in the rental cost for you know you own your building, yes, um, you know other things going to go on. Um, you know we have a bigger bigger footprint, um, but it, it seems like there would be more cost savings, maybe not in the buildings and grounds, but maybe this is more of a question for administration. But um, could could we utilize or um, utilize some of those sort of cost savings for that? Or is that already kind of rent reduction been booked into the uh, operational costs of the courts already? I guess that that's probably not a conversation for the board meeting, but. Yeah, we'll we'll look at that and then we'll get back to you. Chair. Yeah, I, I know that's kind of a very yeah. net, uh, sort of a uh, question that gets into the weeds, but I. To, but yeah, I'll, I'll talk later about it. But I, yeah, I guess I have, I know it's going to cost more. Um, I just think that this, this breakout, I wish it was done in a, you know, bigger, sort of a more of a holistic approach. But I, I understand, you know, the buildings and grounds put it together for buildings and grounds purposes. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm sort of on Martha's rules of order. I'm kind of like in the middle. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I, I can live with it, but I'm just kind of wanted to make my concerns known. Chair, we can still certainly put that information, you know, together so then we have that clarity. Okay, thank okay. you. I appreciate that. Yes. Sir. Any other uh, questions from commissioners? You want to go home. Okay. Um, all, uh, actually, it probably takes a roll call vote, doesn't it, clerk? Yes. yes. Commissioner Streps. Yes. Chair Taylor. Yes. Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Commissioner DeLue. Yes. Commissioner Gistler. Yes. Vice Chair Hepler. Yes. Commissioner Mazur. Yes. Commissioner Morales. Yes. Eight yes. All right. The motion carries. Thank you guys very much. No, no, you definitely get to sit down now. <laughs> All right, next on our agenda is uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for citizens to address the Board of Commissioners. Uh, please give us your name, uh, address, and you'll have uh, three minutes to address the board. Hi, Nancy King, 6th Street, 6th Street, 84 Willowbrook Drive, Kalamazoo, 49048. Um, on behalf of COPE Network, I just want to thank the commissioners for taking into consideration amending our grant to allow us to be able to move forward in purchasing a building. It's been a long road. Um, we identified a building, found it, 
And uh, we're really excited about being able to stay within our time frame of being able to get to our closing date and also to be able to start bringing back our programming as soon as we possibly can. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for staying through the whole meeting to thank us. That felt, that's really nice. <laughs> uh, are there uh, anybody on in the uh, queue or whatever, the inner sphere? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. No, no recordings uh, for, uh, for this part of the evening. Dina, may you advise on any hands that are raised, please? There are no hands raised at this time. Okay, this takes us into members' time. It's an opportunity for board or us to say what we want to say. Uh, Commissioner Hepler. Oh, I, I do get to go first. Okay, yeah, I yeah forgot about this new order, but. <laughs> um, I, you know, we did a lot of really, really transform transformational big things tonight in Kalamazoo. I mean, we, we did uh, everything from our senior millage. We partnered with the C, uh, city of Portage to, to make sure that we um, seniors had transit to get to and from the senior center. We made June 16th uh, a holiday, followed national uh, and made it. What's that? 19th. June 19th. I said June 19th. Did I? Oh, my dyslexia is going into it sorry it's, it's written down 19th but june 19th is a national holiday for county employees um we ensured that all of our employees are going to be paid at 15 dollars an hour um we did a lot of really big things and and to kick it all off we we helped facilitate a 200 million dollar investment in downtown kalamazoo i mean that that's what winning looks like guys that's what winning looks like and and the eight of us uh working there nine of us working as a team was really how we got there. Um, I said at the first meeting that I had uh, with you guys that, you know, we're going to become, we're going to get a lot farther together than we ever will apart. And I think it's, it's showing, it's showing in the community and it's showing to our constituents. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, chair. Um, yes. I, I think it's uh, amazing what we've gotten done. This group is, gelled really well to uh, make a lot of things happen. We do have a lot of work ahead of us. So make no mistake, we're not done. We're just getting started. So um, I applaud all of you and I applaud our staff who has worked tirelessly to uh, bring about these great, uh, great steps that we're taking uh, for our county and for our communities and for our people, our businesses, uh, our industry. Um, I, I go back to to reminding everyone please uh, take a moment to thank those men and women who uh, work tirelessly every day to protect us and su support us uh, the police the fire our military our medical staff our staff for the county there are 900 some employees that uh, that keep the ball rolling here for Kalamazoo County and all of our uh, um, businesses and all of those take a moment to thank them when you see them with that have a good night. Commissioner Morales. Thank you, Chair. So first, uh, we're going to celebrate Women's Month for the entire month, as well as the entire year. So thank you, Commissioner Mazur, Commissioner Strebs, Vice Chair Ray, and uh, Commissioner Wheeler for um, pushing the needle. It's not easy for women to especially be on a, a board of commissioners that's typically run by men, sorry. Um, so we're here to stay and I'm, and I'm very proud of the work that we're doing. Um, everyone knows I have my reservations in the beginning um, with, with our chair and what his agenda was, but I can say that if anyone needed to now look at Kalamazoo County of the staple of bipartisanship, I think this board is excelling in that manner. Last year, <laughs> we, we had some, some rough meetings, but um, to come in and especially do the work as far as you know, our concerns with the arena being built in District 1 and how would it would affect not just uh, Vice Chair Ray's constituents, but all of our constituents and to, for Southwest Michigan First and Catalyst to come through with $6 million to come through with saying, hey, we're going to put um, BIPOC uh, owners into this facility and do it for free. The fact that we got free parking, come on, 
they they <laughs> they came through. We we really had some concerns. So um, I'm proud of this board as well. I don't think we have ever had unanimous <laughs> votes go through, you know, without at least one person saying nay on some of these core issues. Um, I'm happy to see uh, Juneteenth come through. Uh, I had my reservations as well, and I know it came down from the state, but I want to charge this county with actually doing the work for Juneteenth, knowing what it means. And just like there's every other parade, I expect to see a Juneteenth parade, and I expect to see all city and county officials participate in uplifting what Juneteenth really mean. If you need a history lesson on that, y'all come holler at me and I'll, I'll be sure to let you know. But uh, again, to all the women, happy Sisterhood Month, happy Women's History Month, and thank you to all my board and, and people who are putting in the work in this county. Thank you. Commissioner Streps. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, Colleagues, we, we do have a lot to be proud of, and we've worked very hard tonight um, in the spirit of, of teamwork and uh, in recognizing the transformational opportunity um, before us at the event center. I am unfortunately going to ask us to dig in a little bit more right now and have um, some additional discussion. So, um, Council, um, I want to ask you. Um, motion to reconsider under Robert rules of order that motion needs to be presented within the same day um, of a motion made is that correct council it's my understanding that would be within the same session which would have been the meeting previous but I can double check that I'd have to have a moment so uh, certainly I'm not an attorney but my research um, reconsider a motion notes that it must be done within the same day. If you're in a multi-day session, it can be even introduced the following day. So we are not in a multi-day session, but we are in the same day. That's assuming that you're holding a meeting that has multiple sessions, I would have, I mean, I need to look at it, but it wasn't my understanding. I thought once the meeting was adjourned that you couldn't move to reconsider, but I can double check. Okay, well, if, if you could do that as I engage some dialogue with my colleagues. So, um, as we discussed the event center earlier tonight, um, we heard a very exciting uh, proposal from Catalyst Development. And we had a recommendation both in our board packet to have discussion on the item with no potential vote considered for tonight, but a vote to be um, entertained on April the 4th. Council during our committee of the whole recommended that we make a motion to enter into negotiations based on the terms provided to us by Catalyst. But what we ended up moving forward was a motion to finalize. So our terms are very exciting. Uh, I think that they can be fleshed out, but we do not actually have specific con contractual language that this board as a whole has been able to review, but we have stamped it already. And so what I am, proposing we entertain is a motion to reconsider and that we we approve them to move forward with negotiations. We fully want to move forward with this project. We want to solidify the language and the intent of the developer, but to ensure that we have an understanding of these things are, you know, actually are resourced and, and occur, okay? And, and I understand um, your concerns. I, I will be happy as to, you know, to, to let you all know before I sign anything, I will make sure that every commissioner has the exact details. Um, I, I can say that, I mean, these people are leaders in our, their, our community. I, I have full faith and credit that they're going to deliver on what they promised to us tonight. But in, in an abundance, out of an abundance of caution, I can, I can make sure that all commissioners get the final contract before um, I sign, if that would alleviate your concerns. Uh, Kevin. Chair, if I may, uh, commissioners, so uh, authorizing staff, a corporation council, uh, and board leadership to go into negotiations, what, what would happen, the intent would be, is that we would bring that purchase agreement back to the full board for approval. So the board would actually see uh, and be able to review that that purchase agreement 
before uh, the chair is authorized. So the, the motion, I don't know the exact language yet, but sort of on, it'll be a non-consent item and the language would essentially, uh, you know, be a motion to approve a purchase agreement for these two parcels and authorize the county board chair to sign the purchase agreement and, and the closing documents, something to, something to that effect. So it still needs to go through a process. Corporation council still needs to uh, negotiate uh, or, or entertain uh, legal matters with, with their, with their council. But this, this agreement would have to come back to the board. We've never uh, purchased or, uh, or, I mean, kind of an example with the WMU parcel that had, that purchase agreement had to come to the board. There had to be a resolution and it had to authorize the board chair to sign the closing documents. And that would be the same case here. So much chair. So, um, and to, to clarify with the administration, but we didn't make a motion to enter in negotiations. We made a motion to finalize as per the terms was the motion that was entered into the record. My understanding and the motion, I, I wrote a draft motion and chair Taylor, my understanding was you reiterated that motion with a slight amendment was a motion to uh, enter into negotiations with administrator and corporation council uh, to include the terms of the uh, term sheet that was provided by Catalyst with authority for the chair to sign. That was my understanding is that we would negotiate and the motion that you put forward was to allow you to sign that once it was finally negotiated. Provided it met the terms that yeah, were presented. Yeah, of the terms that were presented. Yeah, yeah. the and minimum. I hate yeah. to put you on the spot, Claire Cox. You've been doing such a great job. Do you have the exact or, or close to it? Or I think. Okay. 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 Well, um, yeah. The, yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Schertz. Thank you so much, Chair. Because um, I just, I want to make sure I am understanding council correctly. Because when I conferred with council between our sessions, um, council was it your understanding there there is no additional negotiations that we are no. set to the terms. No. So we do have room to negotiate that we that the Thank motion you. I wrote a motion that the corporation council and administrator would be authorized to negotiate the contract to include the terms they could be better and above but they had to include the terms that were put forward in the term sheet so there would be additional negotiation and finalization of the contract, but that the chair was authorized to sign that in that motion it was not my understanding that it had to come back to the full board for approval. So then clarifying with chair, if negotiations have been approved, uh, language is solidified, it's presented to you for signature, you have asserted you'll allow the rest of this board to review it. What if a board member then has concerns? Um, if there is additional detail or clarification or potentially well-intentioned uh, language of, of the developer is missing something that maybe they are not aware that they are missing, what occurs then? If one, since it was a unanimous vote, if one or more um, commissioners have concerns, I will not sign it. I will hold it in that little desk area room until we next meet and then have an actual vote. And then if it's still not unanimous, but it passes, I will sign it, but I will have an additional vote based on, because our understanding, I, I would rather have this be unanimous. I would, I think it makes a better statement to the community to have it unanimous. So I will bend over backwards to make it unanimous, if you understand. And thank you so much. I appreciate my colleagues. I just want you to understand, um, I am very excited about this process. I just am working to be meaningful to ensure that we are addressing um, the issues that we have articulated in that process. So with that, I think there is much to celebrate. I thank all of you for your work and for engaging in this additional dialogue with me tonight. Thank you. Okay, so you said, well, the, well, the chair would entertain a motion to allow administration and corporate counsel to continue negotiations and for the chair to sign. And then once negotiations are reached, is that appropriate? And then, um, Corporate Counsel Byron said, might I make one suggestion before he moves it, that it include at a minimum the terms and conditions from the term sheet provided by Catalyst to the board this evening. And then you said, okay, I'm gonna 
try to get this right. Chair will entertain a motion that administration and corporate counsel finalize the purchase agreement and the parking options based on the term sheet that Catalyst provided. I will not, and I'll make a commitment to this board if you want to make a motion that I, I do it, but uh, I will not sign it until all commissioners have been given access to that. I'll make sure, Commissioner Schwebs, that you have, you know, that I'll, I'll call you or text you as soon as I email it to you. Um, but, uh, but I will not sign it if there are even one commissioner um, that has a problem with this and will go to the next meeting. We can have, um, you know, an up or down vote, but um, I am, I am at most, po I am positive that these people are going to keep their word. They're not going to come up. I mean, these are, these are community leaders that are running huge programs. They're not going to lie in front of a bunch of people, but you know, I, I, out of an abundance of caution, Commissioner Shreves, I will, I will, you know, offer everybody that, afford everybody that opportunity. Commissioner Shreves. Just to clarify, I don't want to assert, I'm suggesting that the developers are, are trying to lie uh -huh. to us. So I just want to ensure the language is solidified and clear and there's not any uh, gaps that they may not be able to see. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. Commissioner Wheeler. I do not have anything. So everybody have a great night. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner DeLue. Well, I want to thank the women. I didn't know it was Women's History Month. So I'm sorry. <laughs> in case you didn't notice, you actually outnumber us five to four on this board. <laughs> also, um, I think ever since I've been a commissioner, every meeting, somebody has got up there and spoke about what they feel is the unfair pay scale we're currently um, experiencing, I guess, with our employees. And I know the administration has tried to handle it as best they could, but I think as a board, we need to address that and get this handled. I don't know if we have to wait till budget time but just the concerns that have been raised by everybody and in, in the administration in different departments i just we need to to look at it at least i told the prosecutor i'd have a plan um by a week um next meeting um i will share that with so i'm going to sit down with administration and finance um first because they've got to they've got to be part of the solution but um yeah i think this board will be addressing that in the meetings coming up. Uh, Commissioner Gissler. Well, I can't point out because uh, Dale beat me to it that there are more women on this board than there are men. <laughs> I'm thinking about changing my pronouns. Oh boy. <laughs> and we were just getting along too. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Mazur. Well, this was an exciting day, an exciting time to be on this commission, and I am honored to serve with every one of you. So congratulations and thank you. We are adjourned.